Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ESG for Climate Actions International Conference 2023, hosted by World Green Organization in partnership with UNSGEP, Cyberport, FSDC, HKEX, and IFRS. It is our great, great pleasure to have you all here at this conference today. I'm your MC, Eunice. I'll be with you throughout the event. We are living in a world that no country or city where the climate impact cannot be seen and felt. The world is now clearly affected by increasing temperature, ambient temperature fluctuations, variations in precipitation, droughts or flooding, coupled with the frequent extreme weather incidents. To tackle climate change and help stakeholders to develop and review climate actions, WGO in partnership with UNSGEP, Cyberport, HKEX, FSDC, and IFRS organizes this conference aiming to introduce latest international sustainability standards and innovative business models to enhance the sustainability reporting and disclosure quality. Identify best practices for environmental, social, and governance, ESG integration and risk management, develop a common understanding of the latest trends, successes and challenges with corresponding climate actions, demonstrate successful circular economy model, low carbon technologies and showcase carbon neutrality, carbon trading and assets management. Today, we are pleased to have renowned experts from around the world to share their successful experience. Now, before we begin our packed program today, please welcome Dr. William Yu, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, World Green Organization, WGO, to the stage for the welcome remarks. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Dr. Yu, uh, CEO of World Green Organization. Um, I stand before you today honored to address this esteemed assembly of distinguished guests from various sectors worldwide. We are immensely pleased to collaborate with the United Nations, UNESCO again, to orchestra the fourth conference on ESG for climate action. Um, we are equally honored to count on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Financial Service Development Council and Cyberport as our official conference partners. Um, our gathering today goes beyond the conventional scope of other conferences. We are the generation that must confront and resolve the current climate crisis. More recently, the United Nations University um, Institute for Environment and Human Security has proposed a new category of tipping points, namely risk tipping points. It refers to the critical moments when something, whether it is our environment or our society, cannot handle any more pressure and might break down or change dramatically. Let's think of it like a seesaw, okay? like a seesaw. On one side, we have climate tipping points. They are light ways we add to the seesaw, such as increasing global temperatures. If, if we add too many ways, like pushing the Amazon rainforest or the Greenland ice sheets beyond their limits, then the seesaw tips over. We cannot push it back. This will lead to uh, irreversible changes in the climate. So on the other side of the seesaw, we have risk tipping points. They are not always related to physical changes in the environment like climate change. Instead, they are about how our societies and nature will uh, intertwine. For example, how a sudden diseases outbreak could disrupt our healthcare system or how an earthquake could impact our city infrastructure. So in short, after reaching this risk tipping point, the risk of significant damage to our system increased dramatically. 
uh, the UN University, EHS, has identified six risk tipping points thus far. One example would be the concept of uninsurable future. The risk tipping point is reached at the moment when extreme weather events like uh, rainfall, floods, fires, earthquake, increasing in frequency and severity, skyrocketing the cost of insurance, making it unreachable and unaffordable. This happens when insurance against certain risks in specific areas or, or at a fair price is no longer available, resulting in these areas being labeled as uninsurable. So um, using Australia as an example, the UN University estimate by 2030, about 520,000 homes will be deemed uninsurable, primarily because of escalating flood risks. Once we cross this threshold, residents are left without a financial safety net. When calamities occurred, which could trigger a domino effect of socio-economic challenges in this high-risk area. Therefore, facing the current and future crisis, I humbly hope our conference here in Hong Kong can implore our financial elites in this global financial center to take decisive decision against climate change. Making changes to your investment portfolios with the die or, uh, do or die goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The returns are substantial, encompassing both financial and non-financial aspects. Uh, additionally, for this uh, conference, we have undertaken a preliminary carbon audit uh, with our carbon neutrality event partner. So carbon offset has been uh, achieved, acquired by uh, CEL, session by UNFCCC. Finally, uh, please join hands with World Green Organization and many stakeholders to bring tangible changes to Hong Kong and the world. Our goal is not just initiating constructive con conversations, but also following fruit with action, collaborative efforts, and structural programs to lead to possible tangible change. Together, let's make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu, for such a heartwarming welcome. Please be seated. And next, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sam Min Nam, Director, Environment and Development Division of United Nations, ESCAP, to the stage for the welcoming remarks. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Nam. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. William Yu, Chief Executive Office, World Green Organization, honorable guests, esteemed speakers. I'm honored and pleased to deliver this opening remarks at this conference on behalf of the United Nations, ESCA. During last week, I was involved in uh, dialogue, diverse stakeholders and strengthening regional cooperation for climate action. So I was part of the team organized Ace Asia Pacific Urban Forum, which emphasized the climate, urban climate action as a, it's a central theme. This was followed by policy consultation forum on carbon neutrality, engaging diverse government officials from Asian countries and small Pacific Island countries. Here today, I am attending this ESG conference to discuss climate action about the private sector. The call for net zero is becoming increasingly apparent, not just as an aspiration, but an imperative. Independent of their development stages, a majority of countries have announced their net zero target. Governments from both developed and developing countries recognize that a transition to net zero is essential for transforming their economy and their competitive, competitive standing in a rapidly evolving landscape of low carbon technologies and industries. 
developing countries understand they should not be left behind in the evolving landscape. In this connection, the comprehensive and proactive integration of ESG practice is a merely additional corporate strategy. It is a primary business approach to count multi-faced challenges posed by climate change and make the business be part of a net zero economy. The business sector in Asia finds itself at a critical juncture. Asia contributes over half of global GHG emissions with the, with the debt share still on the rise. It also serves as a global manufacturing hub. This means climate change and the transition to net zero have a significant implication for the business practice here in Asia. Asia's accelerated urbanization further requires extensive infrastructure development that should be climate compatible. The swift expansion of renewable is essential to decarbonize our energy system and to address growing electrification of energy consumption, including e-mobility. Considering this backdrop, how can Asian companies pave the way forward a sustainable future? Beijing's are central to this question, both as a contributor to the problem and as a part of the solution. To this end, I would like to bring your attention uh, to Asia Pacific Green Deal for Beijing's endorsed by ESCAP Sustainable Business Network. This deal sets out five key actions. First, advancing net zero, zero carbon, affordable and resilient energy system. Second, constructing smart, low carbon, water secure and climate resilient cities, infrastructure and mobility. Third, mobilizing both public and private finance for green transformation. Fourth, rapidly accelerating and expanding innovation. Fifth, transitioning towards a more circular economy. Expanding economies within this framework is vital for moving towards low-carbon pathways, and therein lies a significant business opportunity. In this regard, companies must maintain the integrity of their climate action and ESG practice. This means avoiding empty declaration of low-carbon or net zero while funding new fossil fuel-based business and not compensating for emissions with a dubious offset credit, not focusing on intensity improvement, but reducing overall emission, and not demanding governments to weaken climate objectives and related regulations. In this respect, ESG should be more than a formality. It should save every strategic choice related to faster realm of climate and environmental action. ESG ought to pursue Reprogging green technologies and practice over mere incremental changes. It should fully endorse the carbon market and pricing tool to internalize climate and environmental cost. Within this framework, financial sector plays an indispensable role in amplifying the importance of ESG and channeling investments towards sustainable endeavors. Instruments like green bonds in fact, investing and sustainable financing can magnify the initiative of business pursuing a greener tomorrow. Lastly, cooperation must be also part of a regional cooperation, which is being led by government state actors. They need to actively engage in international and regional partnerships to foster cooperation, exchange best practices, and innovate collectively. To conclude, the challenges we face is daunting, but collective potential of a business community is equally formidable if corporations fully integrate the spirit and practice of ESG. I look forward to fruitful discussions and insights from this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nam. Please remain on stage, Dr. Nam. Please remain on stage. As we are going to begin our photo session, I'd like to once again invite Dr. Nam on stage. And at the meantime, we are going to prepare this kickoff ceremony. The props that needed. 
and give us some time to prepare that as well. And just in a moment, I'll be inviting our officiating guests to the stage. We are going to have this beautiful props and later on we do have uh, some other props for our guests, officiating guests. And we will do this kickoff ritual to start off the day. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite the following guests to come on stage for this beautiful moment. May I now invite Dr. William Yu, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, World Green Organization, WGO. And once again, Dr. Sen Min Nam, Director, Environment and Development Division of United Nations, ESCAP. And Mr. Tim Lui, GBS JP Chairman, Securities and Futures Commission, SFC. Mr. Ken Chu, Head of Carbon and ESG Products Market, Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, HKEX. And we also have Mr. Peter Yen, JP, Chief Executive Officer, Cyberport. And I'd like to also invite Mr. Chaturan Chayankam, Consul General, Royal Thai Consulate General in Hong Kong SAR. And I'd like to also invite Ms. Kan Se Fosina, Consul General, Consulate General of the Lao People's Democratic Republic in Hong Kong SAR. Last but not least, we have Ms. Pak Putisath Bopiniki, Consul General, Consulate General of the Kingdom of Cambodia in Hong Kong SAR. Here are our officiating guests. Let's give them a big round of applause before we begin the ceremony. And also, Mr. Albert Ong, please be on stage and join us at the officiating ceremony. And all our officiating guests with holding on to the props, let's first take a picture before we do this ceremony. Right there with the handshaking, our cameraman over there. Let's give it a big smile. Thank you for your support. Okay, so on a count of three, would our officiating guests please put the props on the board to kick off the conference? Let's count to three. Three, two, one. Congratulations. May we have a wonderful conference day. Thank you very much. Let's take one more picture and show them a big smile, a cameraman over there. One more photo. And I'd like to invite all guests to remain on stage as we are going to take more group photos. The next photo, I'd like to invite our key sponsors. Firstly, Honorary Diamond, Crystal International Group Limited. Double Diamond, King's Flare Development Limited. Let's welcome our sponsors. Sun Life Hong Kong Limited. And for our Supreme Platinum sponsors, BOC Group Life Assurance Company Limited, A4CR. I'd like to invite you on stage and take the group photo. So more space over here. Okay. 
We're ready for this photo. And later on, we're going to have one more photo. So everybody, please remain on stage. And at the meantime, big smile and smile to our cameraman right there. Thank you very much for our support from our sponsors. Okay, please remain on stage. Now, I'd like to invite our other sponsors, Double Platinum, CS Tech Solution Limited. Let's welcome. And EX0, Infinity International Company Limited. Also, Global Leaders Corporation and Greater Bay Area Sustainability Institute. And we also have Hilla Packard Enterprise, as well as Hong Kong and China Gas Company Limited, Town Gas. Nugawad Technology Limited, and Worldwide Envision Center. And for our platinum sponsors, BDO Hong Kong, and Power Assets Holdings Limited. And also, thank you, our super sponsors, Guangdong Junpin Law Firm and International Chamber of Sustainable Development. And now, our bronze sponsors, EcoSmart and Riskery Consultancy Limited. Thank you very much, and here are our sponsors. And we'd like to take one more photo. Let's stand straight and big smile. There's one more gentleman right here. Okay, make sure you can see the camera right there and the camera will see you. Smile, three, two, one, smile. Cheers. One more, one more down there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all our guests. Uh, please be seated and I'd like to invite Mr. Tim Loy to remain on stage. And other guests, please be seated. Thank you very much for your time. And Mr. Tim Loy is the chairman of the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission. He has extensive experience in the financial industry and serves in various important roles related to finance and regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give our first officiating guest a round of applause, Mr. Tim Lui, GBS JP, Chairman, Securities and Futures Commission, SFC, to give us a speech. Thank you very much, Mr. Tim Lui. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Generals, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It is indeed my pleasure to speak to you today about sustainable finance. On many occasions, I have emphasized the urgency to address climate change and the need to steer financial markets towards a more sustainable tomorrow. I learned from a recent United Nations report that extreme weather events like storms and floods have led to the displacement globally of 20,000 children on average per day. This is indeed a very stark reminder that all of us must take action for our world and especially for our next generation. So today, I would like to talk about Hong Kong's role in the global sustainable finance ecosystem, as well as the importance of adopting internationally sustainable disclosure standards to bolster our role as a leading financial center. My first point is about mobilizing finance to lead the way towards achieving climate targets and advancing the global sustainability agenda. Sustainable finance initiatives can link up capital with economic activities that are low carbon, climate resilient, and sustainable, such as renewable energy and clean transportation. Hong Kong is uniquely positioned 
to capture the tremendous financial, financing opportunities from the transition of mainland China and the wider Asia-Pacific region. Asia's financing needs for green transition are estimated to be about US dollars 66 trillion over the next three decades. Similarly, the mainland needs vast amount of capital to achieve the 3060 climate goals, as its pure green segment makes up only about one tenth of the national GDP. As you know, Hong Kong is a major capital market globally with a large financial footprint, sound market infrastructure, and effective regulatory frameworks. Its equity market has a capitalization in excess of $30 trillion. With nearly a decade of mutual market access developments, the city is also the unparalleled super connector of capital flows between China and the rest of the world. Hong Kong's action in climate finance is set to reverberate far and wide. The Securities and Futures Commission has been pulling its weight to green the financial sector and support capital allocation into sustainable projects. A good example of our continued efforts to facilitate the development of, the, of more ESG investment products in the market. There are now over 200 SFC authorized ESG funds. This number has more than tripled over the past two years with total assets under management surpassing US dollar 150 billion. So given this growing and strong investor interest, it is ever more important that the SFC to step up its efforts to increase transparency for investors to make informed decisions. We do so by promoting better disclosures both at product and fund manager levels to ensure investors can access sufficient information relevant to ESG. In terms of expectations on fund managers, the SFC was one of the first regulators in the region to require them to consider climate risk in their investment and risk management processes and make proper disclosures. These product and fund manager disclosures aim to help investors make better informed investment decisions and understand the impact of climate change on their investments. These are also important steps to safeguard against greenwashing. False or misleading claims may dampen investor confidence in our financial markets and detract from our green transition efforts. Therefore, we work closely with our subsidiary, the Investor and Financial Education Council, to foster financial literacy and enhance the public's understanding of sustainable finance. Making further progress requires coordinated efforts on multiple fronts. So my second point is about the importance of adopting global sustainability reporting standards in Hong Kong. The International Organization of Securities Commissions is a network of over 130 securities uh, markets regulator. In July this year, IOSCO endorsed the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards published by the International Sustainability Standards Board, or so-called ISSB standards. The Securities and Futures Commission participated actively in reviewing the inaugural ISSB standards. We believe they will serve as an international language for investors, enterprises, and authorities to communicate risks and opportunities related to sustainability. Adopting these standards will clearly benefit investors and help address concerns about data availability and quality. This will provide investors with a wealth of reliable, comparable, and consistent corporate information, which is instrumental to informing investment decisions and guiding capital reallocation. But local adoption 
is not an easy task. We must strike a balance between meeting global investors' demands and local regulatory expectations and circumstances, including the preparedness and capabilities of our listed companies and other market participants. For this, the Securities and Futures Commission has been working with government bureaus, relevant authorities and stakeholders to develop a comprehensive roadmap for adopting the ISSB standards. In addition, the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group, co-chaired by ourselves and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, will continue our efforts to support the industry in making sustainability disclosures aligned with international frameworks. The private sector also needs to play a part. As the world decarbonizes and investor needs evolve, firms need to consider how to maintain and build on their competitive edges. Investors may also choose to bypass firms that fail to take timely action on climate risk or make proper disclosures aligned with this global framework. Therefore, businesses have to start familiarizing themselves with sustainability-related concepts and issues, such as the impact of climate change on their operations, their strategies to address these risks, and transition plans. These are all set out in the ISSB standards. So on a final note, we know the road ahead will be challenging, but so far, we have taken on a number of essential first steps. Each of these small steps, trials and lessons, will prove critical for us to go the distance in the long run. The SFC has committed itself to achieving carbon neutrality before 2050, and we are approaching it one step at a time, with an interim target to halving our carbon emissions no later than by 2030. So it is important that we stand united to act now and consistently with a common vision. So without further ado, let's put our words into climate action today. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tim Lay. Please be seated. Thank you. We will now welcome our second officiating guest, Mr. Peter Yen. JP Chief Executive Officer, Cyberport, on the stage to give us a speech on topic of carbon neutrality and climate actions. Mr. Peter Yen is an industry leader with over 38 years of experience in the innovation and technology industry. As the CEO of Cyberport, he leads the digital technology flagship, focusing on talent, cultivation, industry development, and the integration of new and traditional economies. Prior to his role at Cyberport, he held executive positions in various consulting and IT services companies. So, let's give him a big hand. Thank you very much, Mr. Yan. Dr. Yu, Dr. Nam, Chairman Tim, uh, Chairman Ong, uh, Council Generals, uh, we have also, yes, um, Ms. Reckin, yeah, and uh, Council Generals, Honourable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, welcome to Cyberport and we are really honoured to be able to host this uh, World Green Organisation and uh, SCAP's uh, joint partnership on the Sustainable Development Conference. Um, I remember uh, vividly in uh, 2018 when we first uh, host uh, SCAP's uh, physical you know, event at Cyberport and we, of course, you know, was at that time at a different, you know, conference space. Yeah, well, we haven't had this uh, new cyber arena established then. Um, it was very well received. And since uh, 2018, I think the world as a whole has uh, uh, really uh, 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 have quite substantial changes and gone a long, long way, yeah, since then, both uh, in terms of geopolitical situation and also very much so on uh, the environmental aspect. Uh, on the positive side, we have seen uh, many uh, countries, including our own countries, uh, adopted uh, very specific uh, 
carbon neutrality or carbon zero uh, targets. Uh, same with the uh, Hong Kong uh, government. We have also uh, seen a lot of uh, very you know, active uh, initiative uh, uh, pursuing carbon neutrality and sustainable development uh, with, under the uh, UN's uh, 17 sustainable uh, uh, development goals. Um, we have also, of course, uh, seen not so negative things, that uh, we have uh, increased challenges of uh, the environmental issues. Uh, we uh, in Hong Kong has also first-hand experience uh, recently in the last uh, few months on the uh, very extreme uh, 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 climate changes uh, with uh, substantial you know, uh, rainfalls that uh, affected you know, our daily lives. So this is really an imminent uh, topic that uh, uh, we really have to work together, you know, like uh, 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 Dr. Yu mentioned earlier, that uh, we should, you know, join hands to make a difference. Now, uh, we have also, uh, if I zoom in to Cyberport, also made substantial changes. You know, since uh, 2018, uh, I still remember uh, uh, at that time, um, uh, in early 2018, we celebrated our uh, 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 record achievement of going over 1,000 cyberport community companies you know, at that time. Now, uh, in this month, we've actually uh, celebrating another major achievement of going beyond 2,000. So in the last five years, we have doubled our community scale. And one of the major, you can say, uh, contributor to uh, this expanded uh, community is actually the focus of our work in the last few years on what we call uh, smart living cluster development. And within this smart living cluster development, which now has around 800 companies within the you know, cyber community, sustainability or uh, green tech is one of the major or fastest growing sector uh, in, in this area. We have seen uh, really new companies coming up with brilliant ideas to help uh, corporations uh, uh, do better you know, in saving energy. And also we've seen, uh, you can say, spread over of uh, these technology over other areas, even in the financial technology areas with uh, carbon credit tradings and on even blockchain-related technology, uh, which has, again, you know, rapidly, development, uh, rapidly developed in the last uh, few months. Uh, related to um, a sustainable development. So these are really encouraging uh, development that uh, we've seen um, the tech sector also participating uh, or riding on the opportunity to further development, uh, to further develop their, uh, their business. And we want to see more of these you know, happening too. And we are also uh, uh, seeing a lot of achievements by these uh, companies. Uh, we have many of uh, our uh, 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 tech companies here today, and some of them have uh, ach achieved good you know, local awards and overseas awards, and also going overseas to, for example, uh, we have companies uh, going to uh, Middle East, to Dubai, uh, establishing, uh, I understand, in, 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 in Mesta City, uh, uh, environmental improvement works, you know, providing solutions for them. So all these are really coming together, but we still need a lot of uh, 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 effort you know, together to make things happen even faster because climate change is actually uh, affecting us even faster. Now, Cyberport has been, in the past uh, years, uh, focused very much on uh, promoting this topic, as I mentioned earlier, and as a result, having more and more of these companies at our community. Uh, a few things that I would like to highlight uh, we, with uh, uh, the World Green Organization in particular, that uh, last year we have worked together on the accelerator program, the Green Tech Accelerator Program that has uh, uh, been very successful. Uh, and we will continue you know, to support you know, uh, World Green Organization work together to make uh, further you know, uh, development in, in this area. Uh, we will be also, let me also take this opportunity to do a, lot of, uh, to do a little bit of advertisement. We'll be also uh, uh, adding a particular you know, uh, a spotlight event under our annual Cyberport Venture Capital Forum, 
which will happen uh, tomorrow and the day after. Yeah. Uh, so the 31st of uh, October and 1st of November. The second day, 1st of November, we'll have a spotlight event uh, really dedicated for green tech and sustainable uh, development. We, we call it the Green Tech and Sustainability Venture Day. So we want to attract uh, 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 venture capitalists to also come and invest into our communities, uh, green tech companies. Now, all these are things uh, that uh, we are doing our uh, 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 small bits of, of, of things on top of uh, a lot of other organizations, like you know, uh, Chairman Louis also mentioned just now about their uh, great effort in establishing uh, standards, in uh, uh, pushing forward some of the very essential even though he's very modest in saying small steps, but those are essential key steps to promote uh, the development. And we have also seen uh, uh, exchange, uh, uh, building up, uh, establishing the core climate carbon trading platform. So all these, I think, are coming together, and we need your continuous support to make things uh, happen uh, further. And with that, I would like to uh, uh, thank you again you know, for joining us today. And I look forward to having more of these uh, gathering and exchanges uh, in the many, many years to come to let us make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter Yan. Please be seated. And next, our officiating guest, Ms. Peck Putisav Bopiniki, Consul General Kingdom of Cambodia in Hong Kong, as they are, is unable to join us today in person, but would also like to share a few words. So now I'd like to invite Albert Wong to come on stage and deliver her speech on her behalf. So please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank you. I'm honored uh, and delighted to, re to represent uh, Council General of the Kingdom of Cambodia to, uh, to share this message uh, with you all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests and friends, it is with great pleasure and a profound sense of optimism that I stand here before you today as the Council General of the Kingdom of Cambodia in Hong Kong. I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you to the fourth ESG for Climate Action International Conference organized by the World Green Organization in collaboration with our esteemed conference partners, including the UN ASCAP, Cyberport Hong Kong, Hong Kong Financial Services Development Council, Hong Kong Exchange, and IFRS Sustainable Sustainability Alliance. The theme of this year's conference the Purpose Cooperation, Achieving Success in the Emergence of Climate ch Change Challenges, New Standards and Regulations, strikes is a core deep within my heart. In this historical moment, we are transitioning from mere principles to concrete practices, guided by international standards and policies that aim to safeguard our future and foster green economy. In 2022, my heart was filled with immense joy when two significant policy frameworks were approved and introduced to the Asia-Pacific region. The Asia-Pacific Green Deal, led by UNSCAP, and the ASEAN Green Deal, introduced by ASEAN Chairman Somdak Teko Hong Sen former Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Cambodia. He has laid down a, a solid foundation for our collective efforts in addressing the challenges posted by climate change and economic development in the post-pandemic era. These initiatives call for innovative ideas that are comprehensive and commercially viable. As we strive to serve global markets undergoing drastic changes fueled by technological breakthroughs such as AI, blockchain, ChatGPT, Web 3.0, and others. Today, our world communities find themselves at the thresholds of a new world order. 
one that embraced green collaboration and multipolarization with the com common goal of combating climate change, uplifting poverty, raising living standards, and pursuing higher purposes rooted in goodness and righteousness. It is an honour to share this glimmer of hope with all of you gathered here today. As we embark on this conference, I extend my sincere wishes for its resounding success and constructive outcomes. May our discussion be filled with visionary views that unlock the realms of seemingly impossible. Let us seize the opportunity to share knowledge, exchange ideas, and collectively shape a future that is not sustainable but also prosperous for generations to come. In conclusion, I express my deepest gratitude to the World Green Organization and its conference partner and supporter for their unwavering commitment to organizing this prestigious event. Together, let us embrace the challenges that lie ahead, armed with the power of collaboration, innovation, and a shared purpose to create a better, greener, and more peaceful world. Thank you, and I wish you all a memorable and impactful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Albert Wong. Thank you. And of course, thank you, Ms. Peck, for her support. Now, without further ado, let's move on to our first sharing session. As we all know, climate change and environmental degradation has caused increased socioeconomic consequences, harming human health and well-being, especially for the most vulnerable population and countries in Asia and the Pacific. We need to accelerate action by mapping paths to a green, resilient, and more equal Asia and the Pacific. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Sam Min Nam, Director, Environment and De Development Division of United Nations, ESCAP, to share with us on the topic, International Climate Action Progress. Dr. Nam is the Director of the Environment and Development Division at ESCAP. He has a background in academia and policy development, contributing to international efforts on climate change. Let's give him a round of applause Dr. Nan, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I'm standing before you again. Uh, can I see? Okay. My slide. So here, my, my presentation will be brief, but focusing on this regional context of climate change and also highlighting a few notable trends, especially those uh, actions initiated by our member state. So while it is the title is international, but in fact it will be regional uh, in Asia Pacific context. Here, so now, you know, during last uh, maybe three, four years, we are qu we become quite familiar with the, the, the term net zero or carbon neutrality. And it is not only government, but it is not only cities or state actors, but corporations, whether, you know, even net zero still by 2050. So it becomes a new norm. Here, I would like to highlight a few context, uh, regional context of climate change. And Asia Pacific, uh, here for ESCAP, Asia Pacific is from Japan, from east to Turkey, to west, and then from New Zealand to Russia. So the temperature increase is mostly faster than global means. And this results in increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. Currently, so as a result, uh, top 10 countries in the world most vulnerable to climate-related disasters. We have uh, six. Uh, including Pakistan, Nepal, Philippines, and Bangladesh, even Thailand. So we have a home to uh, most uh, vulnerable countries in the world. And we look at the current trend of GHG emissions in Asia Pacific. 
So this is based on our members' data. So that's why maybe you can't see this type of a graph from other sources. Here, emissions from Asia Pacific, it is more than 55%. And that's, it is still increasing. While the developed countries and uh, many parts of the world, we have uh, seen reduction of their emissions. So this is a big concern. I mean, this is a action that we really need to uh, make. I mean, we need uh, to make a quick action. Uh, this is all the uh, slide, but nevertheless. And so now we have uh, many countries uh, have uh, set up this ta target for GH net zero, but mostly focusing on carbon dioxide. Meanwhile, some countries like Thailand uh, put forward both net zero of CO2 and net zero of GHG emissions. Here you can see this uh, uh, green part, which shows nature-based solutions. While currently forest land use and uh, agriculture sector is uh, net contributor to GHG emission, but we should be able to convert that into net, uh, net sink of uh, GHGs. And here uh, I'm highlighting actions by government. So first, uh, this uh, green and uh, blue color, you see this net zero with a uh, long-term low emission development strategies. We have about 40 countries announced the net zero target, but out of 40 countries, only 18 countries developed the long-term low emission development strategies. And then also out of 40 countries, only six countries, including Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Maldives, and Fiji, they developed the law, legal provisions. So, which means, Another 20 countries, they should be able to develop long-term strategy. And also, uh, all countries need to make sectoral policies so they can really support uh, their overall goal. And there are a few countries that haven't announced the net zero target here, including Mongolia, DPRK, North Korea, Myanmar, and Philippines. While we are you know, excited about this announcement of net zero by all the most developing countries, but the challenge is how quickly they can move into the new pathway. China's emission is still increasing, and India's emission is increasing, and most developing countries as well. Meanwhile, this European unions and US, they have seen already a slow decreasing of GHG emission over the last 20, 30, over 20 years. So how to enable those developing countries to, you know, to quickly turn their emission pathways and then make a deep uh, reduction will be key for achieving the, this global goal. And all in that regard, we do need to prioritize the sectors of decarbonization while addressing interdependence of a transformation across sectors. Certainly power sector is the most critical, followed by, and then industry sector, and then mobility sector. But even when we look at industry sector, which uh, subsectors are most important? Steel and cement, oil, and those sectors. And mobility, certainly road sector is the most critical source of emissions. And even building, you know, residential uh, buildings. So, so we do need to uh, really identify critical sectors and then focus on prioritizing those sectors. But all, you know, this uh, power sectors of decarbonization will directly decarbonize all other sectors. And mobility is encouraging electrification will lead to um, also decarbonize other sectors. So we have to also look at this interdependency of a transformation across the sectors. And then accelerating renewable energy depl deployment. Now, you know, China this year, uh, it has more than 1,300 gigawatt of renewable energy. 
Now 50% of installed capacity of China's power is renewable. So 1,300 gigawatt means it's 10 times of total uh, installed capacity of Korea's power. And India renewable capacity is 170 gigawatt. So we have seen this rapid increase of uh, renewables. But most LDCs, those are low income developing countries, they are not making big progress. So how to enable developing, especially low income countries to rapidly ex expand the renewables will be key. And promoting low carbon pathways urbanization. Now about 50% of Asia Pacific people are living in city, but it, is, it will increase. And there is a different level of a, uh, implication. As an urbanization progress, we see increasing per capita emission. But for developed cities, like uh, cities in Hong Kong and uh, Japan and Korea, these uh, transport sectors make some more bigger contribution. But other cities in developing countries, actually it's not a uh, mobility part, but other so sectors from cities are making more contribution. So there is a different type of major sources, but nevertheless, how to our urbanization um, uh, compatible with uh, climate action. And then enabling implementation of a nature-based solution. I am here presenting the case of uh, this uh, long-term low emission uh, strategy of uh, Cambodia and Thailand. We have a consulated general from, from Thailand here. Thailand, for, in order to achieve their net zero, the goal is uh, making 150 million ton uh, to be sequestrated by nature by 2030. And for Cambodia, that's Thailand, for Cambodia, they should be able to sequestrate by 50 million ton per year by 2030 in order to achieve their own net zero goal. So how to make their nature you know, fully able to absorb carbon dioxide will be key. Also, Indonesia's case is the same. Indonesia's emission, uh, actually, land use, forestry sectors is more important. Made, it is contributing almost 50% of total GHG emission. But how to uh, make it, uh, their ecosystem contribute to absorbing carbon, that will be key. So nature-based solutions. And then accelerate the transition, but in a just way. There are almost 7,000 coal-fired power plants in the world. So we are expecting them to phase down, phase out in the next 20, 20, 30 years. But how to make this closing down of coal-fired power plants in a just way, especially for those people employed and those people uh, around the, the the power station, I mean, depending on the, their livelihood. In that regard, you know, our long-term low emission development strategy or NDCs, it is important to incorporate idea and the uh, concrete plan for just the transition. But as you can see here, uh, this uh, light blue is uh, NDCs and the deep blue is uh, long-term low emission development strategies. Compared with other region, uh, Asia Pacific LT LEDs and this is uh, relatively weak in terms of uh, incorporating just the transition in their uh, in their plan. And we have uh, seen, you know, these uh, big gaps between projection and projection and the current uh, renewable development. And so. International energy agencies, World Energy Outlook, try to make ambitious projections, but always we have seen that actual renewable energy development is doubled or tripled from the projection. So, which means now you know most projections are based on our own experience, but this technology advancement is a always beyond our projections. And this is another case. Um, this is a photo of New York in 1850, 1890s. 
1896, there was the first urbanization international conference in New York focusing on uh, how to mitigate this uh, host manual in cities. As a, with the urbanization, as the cities become you know, uh, rich, so there are more horses coming into the uh, cities, and then it is really producing heavy volume of a horse manual. And then there was projection for 2030, uh, 1930. It seems that there is no solution. So this is a photo of 1900. And then in ten, about 10 years' time, it's completely replaced by cars with a, this a Ford's T model uh, system. So the projection that International Conference on Urbanization had uh, three years before 20th century is completely gone. But of course, we have a different uh, types of problems, air pollution and now greenhouse gas emissions from our mobility. So what I'm saying is, you know, we often you know, have a projection about the future based on our own technology. But the history shows that it can be you know, mostly beyond our imagination. So low carbon or net zero pathway, it's a, it's a difficult task. But by you know, having your innovation and then your courage, we can make a big difference that we cannot imagine today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nam. And before we move on to our next speaker, we are honored to have the support from our honorary guest, Mr. Joseph Chen, Under Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, the government of Hong Kong SAR. Mr. Chen was appointed as the Under Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury on 16th of August, 2017. Mr. Chen has many years of senior executive experience in the banking industry. He was a managing director in the Global Markets Division of Credit, Agricole, Corporate, and Investment Bank, and was a managing director in financial markets of Standard Chartered Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Mr. Chen to give us a speech. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Dr. Yu, Dr. Nam, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to join you at the ESG for Climate Action International Conference 2023, a great platform where experts in standards and regulations of combating climate change share their insights and ideas. Statistics indicate that over the next 30 years, the Asian region will require an immense 66 trillion US dollars in climate investment. This underscores the rapidly accelerating demand for green and sustainable finance. To contribute proactively to the country's 3060 deal carbon targets in relation to carbon emission peak and carbon neutrality, as well as proper Hong Kong towards our own carbon neutrality target by 2050, the Hong Kong SL government continues to promote the development of green and sustainable finance, channeling international capital to support green and sustainable projects. Hong Kong, with our open and interna internationalized markets, robust infrastructure, a regulatory regime aligned with major overseas markets, and a simple and low-tax system, not only has the potential but also the responsibility to lead the region in green and sustainable finance. Indeed, Hong Kong is already the largest center for arranging green and sustainable bonds in Asia. Last year, the total amount of green and sustainable bonds issued in Hong Kong topped the league table in Asia, accounting for 35% of the Asian market share. Including both and loans, including both bonds and loans, 
The total amount of green and sustainable debt issued in Hong Kong in 2022 amounted to 80.5 billion US dollars, registering an increase of over 40% from the previous year. As at the end of June this year, there were 195 ESG funds authorized by SFC with a total asset under management AUM of 156.5 billion US dollars, increased by 44% in number of funds and 25% in AUM respectively on a year-on-year -year basis. We welcome high quality enterprises and projects from the mainland and overseas to utilize Hong Kong's platform for green and sustainable financing and certification. In doing so, the government continues to promote our Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme launched in 2021 to provide subsidies for eligible green and sustainable bond issuers and loan borrowers to cover the expenses on bond issuance and external review services. In order to provide benchmark pricing for potential issuers and enrich our ecosystem, the Hong Kong SIO government has issued close to 24 billion US dollars equivalents in green bonds since 2000, 2019 under the government green bond program. These include the tokenized green bonds totaling 800 million Hong Kong dollars in February this year, the first of its kind issued by government globally, and also the issuance of green bonds denominated in US dollar euros and renminbi totaling close to 6 billion US dollars equivalent in June this year, setting a new record for the largest ESG bond issuance in Asia. Earlier this month, retail green bond totaling 20 billion Hong Kong dollars was also successfully launched in Hong Kong, which offers members of the public investment options with steady returns. All of these accomplishments are the testaments to Hong Kong's thriving green finance market. Of course, in addition to issuance of financial instruments, raising the disclosure standard of our listed companies is also very important. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange, HKEX, has taken proactive measures to enhance climate-related disclosures under the ESG framework, fostering transparency and accountability. It published a consultation paper in April this year, seeking market feedback on proposal to enhance climate-related disclosures under the ESG framework, which cover requirements for all issuers to make climate-related disclosures in their ESG reports. The consultation period ended in mid-July. The HKEX has also proposed interim provisions for certain disclosures for the first two reporting years following the effective date of 1st of January 2024. Acknowledging the critical role of talent development in green finance, the government launched in December last year a three-year pilot green and sustainable finance capacity building support scheme to provide subsidies to market practitioners and related professionals as well as students and graduates of relevant disciplines to undertake training in green and sustainable finance. To encourage adoption of innovative solutions in green finance, last week, our chief executive announced in his policy address that we will launch a dedicated proof of concept subsidy scheme for green fintech in the first half of 2024. The new scheme will promote the development of technological solutions and provide early stage funding support for pre-commercialized green fintech conducive to expanding the green fintech ecosystem and developing Hong Kong into a green fintech hub. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hong Kong as our government will continue to work closely with you all, market practitioners and relevant stakeholders to guide international capital into the market to match with quality green projects with a view to promoting sustainable development. On this note, my gratitude goes to WGO for hosting today's event and its continuous effort in covering climate change. I wish you all a rewarding conference today and a thriving and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen. I'd like to invite you to remain on stage for a group photo. 
And I'd like to also invite the following guests on stage for this group photo joining Mr. Chen. Let's invite Dr. San Min Nam, Director, Environment and Development Division of United Nations ASCAP. And Mr. Ken Chu, Head of Carbon and ESG Products Market, Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, Hong Kong Exchange. Mr. Peter Yan, JP, Chief Executive Officer, CEO, Cyberport. And let's invite, once again, Dr. William Yu, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, World Green Organization, WGO. And Mr. Albert Wong, Founder and President of World Green Organization, Co-Chairman of ASEAN Economic Club, Former Chair of UN ESCAP ESBN Green Economic Task Force. Let's welcome you all and thank you very much and let's take a group photo together. Okay, so we'll take one more photo. Before that, please place the, the props onto the board in front of you. Congratulations once again. And take one more photo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Please be seated. Thank you very much. As we navigate the challenges posed by climate change, the need to assess and manage climate-related risk has become paramount. Our next speaker, Dr. Bruce Chong, Director of City Advisory and Climate Service, Arup, will share with us on the topic, Climate Risk Benchmark Alliance. Dr. Bruce Chong is the City Advisory Climate and Urban Sustainability Leader for Arup in the East Asia region. He is also a ROPE's skill leader of city re resilience and sustainable infrastructure design. Let's welcome Dr. Chong. Thank you. Dr. Lam, Dr. Uh, you and honourable guests, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, today, um, I'm on behalf of the Asian Corporate Coalition for Climate Change Resilience, uh, A4CR. Uh, we would like to share with you from a macro perspective how we can work together, uh, at least in Hong Kong and in this region, how corporates in private sector, uh, how we align together to deal with climate risk. Now, um, Dr. Lam and also Dr. Yu uh, gave us a very good start with regards to the tipping point. You just, uh, we call that the collapse of the um, Greenland as well as Antarctica, also the melting of um, permafrost uh, in Siberia. And also Dr. Lam mentioned about the latest situations of how the different developing countries are coping with climate um, decarbonization. Now, we need to deal with the situation that we need to assume the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, cannot, be, cannot be met fully. Um, we already been told that uh, in the coming COP28, uh, it may not be very optimistic that the 1.5 science-based target can be met, right? Because um, just give you some numbers in terms of um, the carbon emission quota. If we, meet, if we need to meet 1.5 degrees Celsius, we only have around 350 billion carbon dioxide tons, right? And then every year still after COVID, we already, we still actually have around every year 40 billion. So meaning we just have around 70, 80 years to go if we continue to keep this emission. Now, so we need to deal with the climate hazard thoroughly and in detail. Now, as a beginning, um, as a backdrop, just to let you know, these two dates, um, I'm still um, <clears throat> taking this as, a, as an example because it's very important to let you know on, the, on your left-hand side, the 7th of September, still, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you still you know, memorize 
um, this day is a black storm. Black storm in Hong Kong meaning 70 meter, millimeter per hour. Now this storm, black storm, taking the whole day, you know, continuous rainfall in total 600, hour, 600 millimeter in total, the volume, and the peak hour, the rainfall intensity is 158 millimeter, so almost two times more you know, than the sort of the benchmark of the black storm in Hong Kong. 500 years in return period. The right hand side, just around six days before the black wing storm, solar, tropical cyclone solar, hit Hong Kong. The key message here is that these two events were not happening in the same day. Now on the left hand side, you still record that a lot of, uh, a lot of areas in Hong Kong were flooded. On the right hand side, there are also storm surge and also um, corresponding damages. But these didn't happen in the same day. Now imagine that these two happen on the same day, meaning we have heavy rainstorm in the urban area. We also, in the coastline area, we have the storm surge because of the typhoon-induced increasing sea level rise and hitting our land area. Then what would happen? Now this were happened before because we encounter a lot of tropical cyclone. Kempusu, this is called in Chinese, Yun Kui, sorry for the Chinese, right? Now this is another example that the tropical cyclone hit Hong Kong with heavy rainstorm, with storm surge. That would cause us these kind of events and disasters. But the key message here is that now urban rainfall, coastal rainfall happen together under this tropical storm. Now be aware of what I'm talking about, tropical storm only. It's not Yun Kui, it's not tropical cyclone or super typhoon. It's only tropical storm already caused this kind of disasters. So the key message of this, they are not happening together. This is not tropical cyclone, it's not super typhoon, it's not T10. So we are talking about how to prepare for the worst situation in Hong Kong because we have yet to encounter the worst, also of the worst of the worst, and it would happen. Oh, by the way, the first one, if you recall solar, solar actually is a T10, the first page. It is hitting Hong Kong around 30 kilometers southern side of Hong Kong. And you see quite a lot of typhoons, even mangoed, and also Heito, you still record it in 2018, 2019? It's and other super typhoons. It's hitting Hong Kong around 150 kilometers outside Hong Kong, the southern part of Hong Kong. It still causes you know, so kind, <clears throat> you know, this kind of damages. But here, the key message here is that when we're talking about worst case, we need to, we need to face the geographical situation that we have you know, <clears throat> more than a few thousand seacoasts in terms of kilometers. And then most of the areas in our Victoria Harbor is less than five MPD. Now, I'm an engineer, so MPD meaning the height right, of our coastal area. In average, Victoria Harbor, do you know what is the average MPD? It's around 1.5 in average. 1.5 MPD in Victoria Harbor, our sea level. And then our Victoria Harbor in average two to three, some areas 45, some new town area, right? I mean, relatively new town area, meaning Sha Tin, um, Taipo, right? But more or newer, even uh, our town area in, 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 in Dongchong is around 6, our 5.5 to 6. Our third one way airport is around 6.5. Now, in average, 1.5, but with the storm surge, it will become around 5 to 6, right? 5 to 6, or even worse. Now, um, the Hong Kong government, uh, we are foresight enough. I'm not representing the Hong Kong government, but actually, the government have already conceded quite a lot of sort of worst case situation taking into account, for example, the heat on cases. Say I mentioned a couple of typhoons, right, from solar, mango, and Heito, they're super typhoon, and assuming they're all happening together with urban flooding, black rainstorm, also we have the coastal flooding, storm surge, as well as high tide. So if all of them happen together, so that would be quite disastrous, and we need to understand how much it would actually hit Hong Kong. So this is something that we have already done. And based on this, to identify appropriate situation and appropriate responses and sort of the continuity plan. Now, 
Added to this sort of physical risk, we also encounter, and we need to also face from private and public perspective, the disclosure requirements. So we have ISSB, and together with the stock exchange, which requiring more stringent, more scientific, and more quantitative, if you like, statistical-based disclosure in terms of both carbon and climate. Now, i just um, give you some quotes directly from the recent consultation paper from the stock exchange. There are a few bullet points saying the ISSB climate standard requirements. So A and B on greenhouse gases, so we just talked about you know, carbon emissions needs to be quantified, score one, two, and three. Now, this section, I would like to draw your attention to the more physical climate risk. So point C and D, the keywords actually is the amount and percentage of asset and business activities subject to physical risk and also opportunities. Now, these are the requirements being requested by stock exchange under the framework of TCFD and also ISSB. So basically, all the private sectors, we need to take this into account. Not like it or not, this is sort of the mandatory sooner, later. We need to be more statistical. We need to be based on some more scientific. It's not all qualitative, because every people now talking about, oh, climate change. Yes, we cannot only consider 1.5, not only carbon reduction, but also climate adaptation. Yes, we all know this. But how to tackle this? This is something that we need to think deeper. Now, in a nutshell, no, um, these are the key pain points that we are now facing. Now, the first point, actually, is Climate change is not only a global issue, but also a regional issue, and also a locational issue. So we need to take into account the location-specific climate projections. Right? We are not talking about the whole Hong Kong. We are talking about the differences between Central and Dongcheng. Right? We are talking about the difference between North Machau and our Repulse Bay. Now, this is talking about locational specific. So we need to understand the difference between a district and specific area in order to cope with it specifically. This is number one. But how to do with it is something that we need to think about. We need to have climate scientists to help us. The second point is how extreme in the extreme. Just riding on what I share with you, right? In early September, the black rainstorm, also solar, T10, they were not the worst. Or even the combination of both could not be the worst, or the direct heat on typhoon could be the worst. You know? Now, this is something that we need to deal with it seriously, especially if your asset is critical. For example, hospital, right? data center, schools. Right? Now, these are the critical facilities we need to consider. Even your daily operation with very important, significant supply chain, you need to identify where area or which location is critical to your operation, and then we need to consider Specifically, how worse is worse. Okay, moving on to the third point. A lot of people talking about, oh, we already comply with standards, right? There are different engineering technology standards that we can comply with. But the key pain point is that they are not quick enough to follow climate change. There are a lot of design engineering standards with regards to drainage, coastal infrastructure, highway design standard, especially in developing countries, are yet to be updated, right? Um, drawing your attention to Hong Kong, we are relatively fortunate that government has been reviewing and updating the climate standards, not only based on historical data. Now, when we used to use the term return period, basically it's based on historical data. Now, we're engineers, we are familiar with these terms, but return period, basically, we just based on statistical historical data, but we need to incorporate future climate data into the design. However, the latest design, whatever, Usually, you know, in the development countries have not coped with these latest updated information with respect to the specific location. So these are the sort of the third pain points. Moving on to the fourth one, maybe you're also you know, asking how to quantify this. So basically, if we understand the physical damages, so how can we turn it into monetary term? So a lot of insurance company, FI and banks are asking for this. So meaning we are actually helping especially the built environment under different, as I mentioned, different climatic scenario. For example, direct heat on situation, super typhoon with high tide, rainstorm, as well as coastal, infrastructure, coastal, um, coastal 
flooding. So how would it you know, collectively contribute to the damages and interruption? Now this is the quantification we are proposing um, to the industry as well as quantifying for respective clients to deal with it. Now how to do, you know, having all sort of the pain points. Now how to resolve on how to you know, work together to resolve all these issues. Now, so we think that thanks for support from World Green Organization as well as we partner with our uh, partnering organization, we are keen to collectively resolve these issues and deal with it seriously through the alliance of these corporations that you are also familiar and some of you also sitting down there. So thank you very much for all your support. And then we're not only you know, forming an alliance, but actually collectively resolve the problems, the issues I just shared with you. Um, I will quickly go through this. Um, so this organization, we you know, form an alliance called A4CR, you know, the Corporate Coalition for Climate Change. We are helping the companies have some sort of clinic workshop to understand our situation, to benchmark ourselves with respect to the industry, both locally and also regionally. We also have to review the policies, for example, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange Consultation Paper. We address this and also reflect the concerns from the industry. We also obviously have the knowledge sharing sections amongst all our members' companies. So here are some of the examples that we share from training to also benchmarking, workshop and clinic. Well, um, we help them, for example, in the previous year, the TCFD framework, you know, there are four pillars from governance, strategy, risk management and also metrics. We help them to understand where they are and how they can proceed and how they can accelerate at some different locations at their gaps and how they can further improve. For example, here are some sort of knowledge sharing sections that these companies, also our members companies, how they are acting, how they are responding to climate resilience. For example, they're starting from portfolio level assessment, um, understand the overall situation of the risk and resilience and also the opportunities. So we call it portfolio level, tier two, corporate level, just like you do a sort of body check and identify your problematic areas and then move on to sort of design evaluation, more deep dive analysis with respect to the asset. Um, more importantly, a lot of companies, um, they're sharing with us that they are actually developing their climate resilience guideline to help their companies to understand you know, different business units, how to actually respond to climate risk and opportunities. Now, this is something sort of the best practice that best practice that we're sharing uh, with the Mamex companies and also pushing some boundaries uh, under the topic of climate risk and resilience. So here's sort of summary of you know, some best practice, um, how they are responding from a you know, few years ago, the top-down you know, governance and also commitment from the board of directors, TCFD commitments, you know, earlier on, you know, even before you know, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange requirement and also ISSB you know, a few years ago, and then doing portfolio level assessment, move on to deep dive level, and then I mentioned about the climate resilience guideline for the companies, and more importantly, how to make it internalized in their risk management system. So something, the good practice with respect to these companies uh, were being shared uh, amongst um, the alliance. So here are some photos you see um, during the past um, two to three years, how we are you know, working together, sharing knowledge together. And I think it's a very good case that in this um, um, GBA area, how companies are working together, not only a top down and also, you know, also driven by both the public as well as the private sector, um, seriously taking about, um, seriously uh, uh, considering um, the uh, climate risk and resilience. So uh, if you're interested, um, you can also get in touch um, with William and myself, Bruce Jong, and hope you're with me so far. Thank you very much for this section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chong, for your sharing. Carbon markets has played an important role in the fight against climate change. By trading carbon credits, businesses are able to effectively manage their greenhouse gas emissions. It is already a common practice in Europe and the US. While in Asia, Hong Kong Exchange is a pioneer in leading this effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, Mr. Ken Chu, Head of Carbon and ESG Products Market, Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, HKEX. Mr. Ken Chu serves as the Head of Carbon and ESG Products at HKEX, 
responsible for fostering the exchange's carbon and ESG product businesses. Today, he will give us a sharing on carbon trading development. Let's welcome Mr. Chu. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, bear with my voice, not be all because of the climate change. <laughs> um, Dr. Yu, Dr. Nam, Mr. Chen, Mr. Yan, Honorable Council, General, Distinguished Guests, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you, the World Green Organization, um, to invite us to be here again uh, to join you for the ESG for Climate Actions International Conference 2023. I still remember last year, uh, it was like yesterday, uh, that we wrote our core climate, um, and many things happened in the past 12 months. So today I would love to take, some, take this opportunity to share with you uh, the latest development uh, in the carbon market. Uh, just raise a couple of points before I run into a couple of key messages I would like to um, share with you today. Uh, first of all, uh, what I share with you today is really my individual personal comments and nothing to do with EX. Right. It's a very, very important disclaimer. And the second one is I, I try to do more verbal uh, because the slide I keep it very, very generic. Uh, and the third, third point I would love to share is um, I think I would try to run through today um, uh, the next 15 minutes in a couple of uh, messages. The first one is about the overall market landscape. The second one is about the um, market, common market development in particular. Uh, third one is something a bit more about EX, because I, I know a lot of uh, distinguished guests has mentioned about Hong Kong EX. Uh, fourth, about core climate. And next, which is even more important, for looking. Okay, without further ado, um, I don't need to read this disclaimer again. Um, so I, wh why, do, why do I do this? I, I just give it on a very, very... Um, Verbal. Um, I mean, this slide I think we can share with you after, after the, 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 the conference. Okay. The first one about the overall market landscape. I think uh, the key uh, things I would like, the key message I would like to highlight in the past 12 months is there are a lot of debates, market debates about certification methods, and there are a rapid change in macro environment. Uh, without elaborating too much into the details, which I think all of us are quite clear about that, that I would like to share a set of data to, Im, uh, to imply and try to uh, deliver this message across. In terms of issuance, the VCA voluntary carbon market credit issuance, uh, if you compare 2021 and 2022, it was down by 21%. Kind of a good news is that it stayed about the same level if we see the first half data between 2023 and 2022. The second set of data I would like to share with you is that the retirement. There was a mild decrease in uh, 2022 versus 2021 full year. It was around minus 4% in terms of retirement. Uh, and 2023 first half is similar to 2022 first half. It was staying at around 79 million tons uh, as such. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is uh, in terms of issuance, um, obviously there are a lot of uh, discussion. You can see the news about the methodologies, particularly focusing on forestry conservation. Um, and there are a lot of um, revamp uh, following after that. And also there are a lot of uh, news about how do we use uh, carbon offset as such. Let's not forget that actually carbon market or carbon offset is at actually, as in my opinion, the last stop of the decarbonization journey. Uh, all in all, we always emphasize that uh, in order to achieve net zero, like many distinguished guests have mentioned, the, the route that has to be taken involves many uh, steps. The first step is to understand your emission, to calculate your baseline. Second one is to reduce, right? Uh, be it from a, a jurisdictional level, like more utilization of renewable energy, from a corporate level or product level to understand the emission uh, of, uh, of your product and your uh, commercial competitiveness. And after that, uh, we need to formulate a strategy uh, to reduce and for the undebatable then we tap on the carbon market. So actually, if we're just focusing on the last step uh, of, of, the, of the equation, uh, all these debates actually, first of all, I think is very healthy because uh, nothing is a straight line development. The second one is that raised a lot of um, market attention 
to de develop further the next step, which is one, to de develop a better market trust uh, in terms of building credit, a credit, uh, a, a, a carbon credit quality and integrity, as well address one of the pain points that we always come across when we speak to our counterparty, which is how do we say uh, utilization, how do we make good use of a carbon offset is the right way. Then we come to the second message I want to share with you here uh, in terms of the market development, such that there are a lot of uh, development in terms of trust and standards. Um, to reiterate what uh, uh, Bruce just mentioned, uh, we talk about standards. There are tons of standards we're talking about. The first about is emission. Second one is about the carbon offset uh, itself, like the asset creation cycle and so on. Uh, here, I also, I mean, uh, from an EX perspective, there is also disclosure requirement. So there are many standards we are talking about, but all this cannot live without the other. So there are a lot of uh, market development in terms of um, disclosure happening in the past uh, year. Uh, I think many of us mentioned about the ISB published the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standard in June uh, 2023, S1 and S2. And following that, Hong Kong EX has published a consultation paper and to determine the rollout of the potential measures in order to help to improve the uh, disclosure for the listed company in climate. Second one I want to draw attention is the ICVCM published the, uh, the CCP, the Core Carbon Principle, in March 2023 in order to establish the fundamental principle for high quality credits that create um, a verifiable climate impact based on latest science and best practice. That's very important to address something I mentioned in terms of the debates, in terms of, for example, a REPLUS methodology. The third one I want to draw attention is the VCMI, which, is pub which has published the claims code of practice in June 2023. They provide a clear requirement, recommendation, and supporting guideline for company and other than non-state actions, NSA, and how they can credi uh, credibly make voluntary use of carbon credits a part of their near-term emission reduction objectives, and so on, that address the right-hand side of the equation, meaning other than credit creation, we talk about the usage. So we have disclosure, asset creation, and usage. Last but not least, uh, that has been less mentioned, but it is very important, especially to uh, Hong Kong EX or Core Climate, where we operate a market. IOSCO has published the final report on the carbon market in July 2023. So they enhance the governance and consistency of carbon market. What does that mean? Other than the, I mean, the, the carbon market is a very interesting market. It involves two parts. One is about carbon. One is about market. Um, the disclosure and the asset creation and the usage is more about carbon. But the market discipline, i.e., for example, participant behavior and so on, it's really something that's uh, worth exploring. And obviously, from a core climate perspective, we've been following on that very, very closely. So after all this, uh, what we have done, that's the third message I want to, to come across, Hong Kong EX actions. Uh, the special thing about EX, we have three roles in one. The first one is we are a regulator, um, of course, following the guidance from FSTB and SFC. Uh, so we have a listed company uh, as a regulator. We're also a market operator, so we all operate stock market, commodity market, derivatives, and carbon. And third, we ourselves is also a corporate, even though we list on our own venue. So as a regulator of ESG, uh, a regular disclosure requirement, actually date back to 2023, we first introduced ESG disclosure requirement. In 2016, we require all listed issuers to publish ESG report on an annual basis. In July 2020, we incorporate key elements of TCFD recommendations. In 2022, we update the corporate governance code to a single gender board by 2024. And in 2023, we launch public consultation on the enhancement of corporate disclosure with the ISSB climate standard under ESG frameworks. So we're currently reviewing the market views, and we've announced uh, our conclusion, hopefully, towards the year end. And second, as a market operator and a listing venue, we have done multiple actions. First, we signed MOUs, for example, with China Emission Exchange Guangzhou in 2022, 
and explore opportunities in supporting ESG and green finance, and hopefully more to come. We focus on market education, and Hong Kong EX provides education and help for issuers and investors to understand and adapt involving ESG requirements. For example, ESG Academy, Net Zero Guide, and Climate Disclosure Training. The fourth message I want to come across is about core climate, because core climate is actually one of the key initiatives as a voluntary marketplace uh, under Hong Kong EX. Uh, maybe not, not all, a lot of us know that core climate is not just about name of a platform, but it's actually a fully owned subsidiary of Hong Kong EX, and we have fully capitalized this entity in around 250 million Hong Kong dollar. So uh, since the launch in October 2022, Actually, we only published some data the first month. At uh, that time, we have around 20 plus participants, around 30 project shelf, and around 400,000 tons of carbon credits uh, trade. And actually, as of today, there are many developments uh, we would love to share with you. In the past year, almost one year, uh, the participant has grown threefold to 70 plus market participants. The project has almost doubled. We have almost 50 plus project shelf on core climate. We're happy to share that uh, for many of the projects in question or heavily beat debate, we don't have that on our platform. Uh, in September, we also signed a letter of intent with one of our local corporate, Kimming Resources, as, and, and they have bought over 200,000 tons, and not to mention that they have committed over long run for carbon offset procurement via core climate to facilitate the company's decarbonizing journey uh, on core climate platform. The collaboration will help support regions transition to low carbon economy, reflecting the critical role the carbon market will continue to play in practical climate related solution. And also one point I would like to highlight is that it's not on only about trading, because I know, uh, I mean, a lot of platforms love to use volume as a way to measure, but from core climate perspective, we always love to share, I mean, try to secure long-term demand user as our preliminary focus. Uh, final one I would love to share with you is the forward looking in the interest of time. Hong Kong EX will continue to lead the market development towards prudent corporate governance and ESG uh, framework. Through establishing unique ecosystem of carbon market in cooperation with different stakeholders, Hong Kong EX will continue to build a long-term sustainable and stable uh, international carbon uh, market. A uh, couple of things I want to highlight um, uh, as, uh, as a conclusion. First of all, we are eyeing on further carbon market development, including one, VCM, um, a voluntary carbon market with all various standards development. And second, the China and other jurisdiction. I would love to highlight China. I'm not sure if you follow the news closely. In the past seven days, or slightly more than that, eight, eight to ten days, uh, MDG, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, has issued at least three sets of new regulations restating the launch of CCER. They don't call it the relaunch, but launch. The first set is about the, the rules to manage CCER. The second set is about the four methodologies attained to the CCER. The third is about several roles in order to operate the scheme, which consists of one, the registry to be operated by NCSC of MDE. The second one is the Beijing Green Exchange will be responsible for trading and settlement uh, of uh, the CCER scheme before there is a national market uh, to be formed. What I'm trying to mention here is it's all about interoperability on different markets. Uh, Second point I want to raise is we want to eye on the linkage between not just the interoperability across markets, but also within the same jurisdiction. There are not actually quite a number of developments. For example, in one of the Asian uh, jurisdiction country, there is a linkage between uh, carbon tax and VCM, i.e. in that particular jurisdiction, corporates under um, uh, as, uh, the coverage of the carbon tax, they can use VCM as an offset uh, for uh, the carbon uh, tax uh, payment. That's one thing. Second one is, there are also global schemes that we're eyeing on, for example, CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. 
Those are very important to the decarbonization journey of all us sitting here. A third point I would love to highlight here, especially the tech, because I know we're here in the cyber port, but tech can really help the transformation and the transition. In carbon space especially, we're focusing on MRV, so the measurement, reporting, and verification. And the last point I would like to mention is the education, not just to individual, uh, after all this heavy rain and severe uh, weather behavior, but also commercial. Uh, because the net zero uh, action will, be, will take, take place much faster than we expected. So finally, uh, thank you very much uh, to have a chance to share with you a couple of points here, even though I'm not following my slides. And I would love to work with all of you closely to combat against the climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ken Chu. Thank you. Now, our topic is on life cycle assessment for credibility in ESG reporting. Our next speaker holds a PhD in civil and environmental engineering. His research focuses on designing indicators for sustain sustainability and resilience of the built environment, supporting decision making for a socially just and sustainable future. Let's welcome Professor Sharad S. Chopra. Assistant Professor, School of Energy and Environment, City University of Hong Kong. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, quite honored to be presenting in front of you this uh, quite important topic uh, on uh, life cycle assessment for uh, credibility in ESG reporting. Um, and this is specifically talking about uh, scope three. Uh, so, just to give you a sense of what the kind of work that we do, we look at the, uh, the built environment as a system of systems and we apply uh, systems modeling, analytics, simulation uh, to support data-driven decision-making for sustainability and uh, resilience. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I, I, so what we do is we develop models, right? And we develop models to help you uh, translate the information and uh, make decisions uh, that are going to be useful for your ESG journey, journey, both internal for internal applications as well as uh, uh, for external compliance requirements. And you all are very much aware of greenwashing being the the theme of since the past what five years. Of, this is. From 2019, this is uh, the International Accounting Standards Board Chair uh, referring to the, the greenwashing being rampant. And uh, in addition to greenwashing, I don't know if you're aware of this newer idea of green sheen, which is referring to the fact that our sustainability uh, um, uh, reports are, are basically just a way to highlight all the great parts about what the organizations are doing. So it, it comes off as just putting a highlight on what is good and not really disclosing the risks, right? So, so in that sense, uh, greenwashing becomes uh, something that we need to ch uh, challenge by providing credible data and models behind them. And, and we, I always ask this question in my work, uh, do rising sustainable investments in ESG reporting ensure a just transition towards a more sustainable, resilient, inclusive economy? Right? And the answer is no. Uh, and this, has, this was also something that we, we saw previously. Um, and that's fine. I mean, it, it's like expecting financial accounting to solve the economic problems, right? Like, and that's not gonna happen. Uh, and the same way sustainability uh, uh, reporting is not expected to solve planetary problems, right? And that's all right. But the, the concern is that a lack of credibility in data sets makes the whole process look shady, right? And so if we want to make uh, models and uh, reports that are credible and we want ESG to be uh, a, a vehicle of investment that we want to see in the future, uh, we need to be able to uh, inject more credibility with, uh, with real data. And uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, why we were being targeted as being uh, as in, in the ESG field as being uh, in uh, comprehensive was the lack of focus on uh, scope three emissions. So the scope three emissions, as you can see here um, from, from the charts, uh, 
represent a significant amount of carbon emissions from for all of the sectors. So, right, you, you see scope one and two in orange and yellow, and that's what is required for us to report. Uh, but everything else, which is anywhere from uh, 60 to 90 percent of the emissions, uh, come from scope three, and they are not being factored. So the challenge has been how it's very, well, it's very difficult to do it. Um, and, and, and that's actually true. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, we're not, we're not making excuses uh, when we say that scope three calculations have been a challenge for the industry. However, the, the focus has to be on uh, developing better tools uh, that can help make this process more uh, straightforward and, uh, and so that we don't have to do this again and again. We can develop models that can be used uh, for, for, for various uh, purposes. So, so the idea is how can we use uh, LCA as the basis that can be used to do scope three as, uh, assessments down the line. So in 2023, we get um, ISSB's um, uh, S1 and S2 uh, sustainability disclosure uh, and the climate related disclosures requirements, which is uh, uh, a step in the right direction to say the least. Uh, and I say this with the, uh, with the focus, or especially on the SS, uh, IFRS S2, which focuses on scope uh, one to three emissions. So that's, that's great because it gives a new sort of uh, emphasis on uh, quantifying the emissions associated with the value chain, uh, which are both upstream and downstream. And another thing that I uh, also would like to identify and mention here is that scenario analysis related to resilience was uh, picked up, uh, this, which is also quite important given the fact that there are resilience implications that are emerging from your supply chains as well. So it's not just about climate risk uh, that we have on the, the, the sites that we own, but also the supply chains have, uh, are, are basically uh, uh, ways through uh, which the climate risks are going to affect our bottom line. Right? And so if we do not account for that, then it becomes very difficult to expect ESG ratings and uh, data to have a sort of a, re a direct relation to returns, which we don't have right now because there is no supply chain uh, built into our both climate risk side as well as the uh, emissions side. And, and so there as well, I would say the, the having, having tools like LCA uh, can inform um, the, the resilience side of things as well uh, that are about emission uh, or, or extreme events ha occurring on supply chains uh, that will have uh, issues on the or, or will affect your resilience to such events um, from your value chain itself. All right, so this was the key takeaways that I wanted to highlight, so highlight, so, uh, scope three. Uh, so now we have greenhouse gas emissions are further divided into 15 categories, eight of which are upstream and seven of which are downstream from the entity, right? So there are 15 uh, scope three categories that we need to uh, quantify down, down the line. I mean, at the moment, we don't have to do all of them, uh, but eventually this, was, this is what is going to happen. Um, then there's a, a, a greater focus on scenario analysis. So we need to create uh, exposure, uh, entities exposure to climate risks and opportunities. And we need to do, uh, um, be able to list out the skills, capability, and resources available to the entity to enable it to carry out the climate-related scenario analysis. Uh, so scope three and scenario analysis together uh, tie in to inform the climate resilience of the organization um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the long run. So you need, what you need are, is information about entities' climate resilience uh, to enable users to understand key areas of uncertainty, uh, the implications uh, for the entity's strategy and business model, and its adaptive capacity. And uh, the adaptive capacity is key here, right? Because we want to be able, resilience is a, a verb, so we have to show how do we do resilience, right? So it's not risk, which happens to us. Uh, resilience is what are the steps we take, right? So it's your adaptive capacity, uh, and so we need to find, uh, address or uh, lay down ways in which we have 
the adaptive capacity in our supply chains to bounce back from supply chain or policy shocks uh, that we would continue to see with more uh, frequent and high intensity extreme events like the typhoons uh, that we were talking about a, a, a couple of presentations ago. And there's, there's a need for information to be released on how Entity has carried out climate-related scenario analysis. So this, this, the burden of evidence is, is falling on, on the Entity to provide all of this information. Scope three, very data-driven scenario analysis, very data-driven, specific, spatial, and climate resilience also requires you to be innovative in coming up with strategies, breaking your existing business models, or even at least thinking outside the box of uh, the industry and looking at the larger supply chains that are emerging from global, uh, uh, that have global sort of uh, footprints. Those have to be acknowledged, uh, and that, that's, that's a, a tedious task that's highly data intensive. It requires uh, interdisciplinary knowledge of climate models to engineering, to uh, uh, finance and uh, economics, uh, and, as, and eventually all of this has to be translated into strategies by, by the board, right? So that's, uh, communicating this internally as well as externally becomes a challenge, uh, and, and companies that would be able to do that would be uh, at the forefront. And, and I think that that's uh, what I would like to highlight, that we need to invest in building these models out. And um, the, the sooner we build them out, we will have a, an, an advantage. Now, um, look, let's look at the life cycle assessment specifically. Now, life cycle assessment is a, is a very established methodology. I mean, it's not very new. Um, it's ISO standardized, uh, 14,040, 44. And uh, it basically covers the entire value chain. Uh, you can see the, uh, the product, product life cycle emissions have been mapped to the upstream and downstream, which are, represent the scope three emissions. And uh, you can see the, the green running through scope three upstream, scope one and two, and then downstream scope three. Right, so what you see is that life cycle uh, assessments are actually bigger or cover more than uh, scope three emissions. So you can think about scope three emissions as a, as a, a lighter version of uh, LCA, or you'll use some of the information from LCAs to come up with your scope three calculations, right? You won't, you won't need to do uh, full-fledged LCAs all the time, uh, and they won't be completely useful because that's a different altogether. Uh, LCAs have a different protocol, which is associated with product life cycles. Um, and what we are focusing on is scope three. So I just want to uh, make it clear that scope three is not a solution, uh, sorry, LC is not a solution or a direct fit solution to address scope three. What, what, what we're saying is that the LCA methodology allows you to come up with greenhouse gas emission factors that cover the life cycle and uh, the ability to use these LCIs and build these models out is going to be uh, key for coming up with scope three emission factors. And this is uh, urgent given the fact that we have um, uh, guidance from the Hong Kong Exchange that there might be uh, a requirement to, for the first two years following the effective date of first Jan that we have uh, disclosures on scope three emissions even though there's some uh, uh, leeway in that in terms of it doesn't have to be quantitative in the first uh, year itself. So here is uh, the life cycle, uh, so the, the impacts uh, associated with the upstream and downstream uh, within the scope three that have been mentioned. So there are different types of um, uh, categories. There's, so the fifth, out of the 15, eight are in upstream and the remaining seven are in downstream. Uh, and so I look at it and say that it's not, LCA doesn't fit everywhere, uh, it, it fits in four places particularly, there's purchased goods and services, and there's capital goods that you need some life cycle uh, information or life cycle inventory information associated with the purchased goods that your organization or entity has, and then capital goods in terms of, say, the equipment, uh, like a factory that you put in or uh, uh, a new reactor that you put in. Uh, so, so 
coming up with the life cycle inventory emissions associated with uh, purchased goods and capital goods, uh, fuel and energy related activities, and processing of sold goods may have some use of life cycle assessment in order to come up with company specific uh, uh, greenhouse gas intensity factors that you can use and straight away multiply it with the amount of activity that you have uh, in that particular year to determine your uh, uh, the scope three emissions. So what, what, I, what I would exp uh, like to expand here is that existing LCI databases can do or, or are pretty good uh, starting points for us to um, come up with greenhouse gas emission factors for the different uh, purchased goods, capital goods, and, and the other factors that we have to uh, estimate. Now, the remaining scope three categories will be either provided by other third party organizations or can be covered by the, the, the entities uh, such as, uh, say, um, infrastructure, uh, utility, public utility companies and their um, greenhouse gas emission factors and uh, can be used. Uh, so I can give you an example of business travel. Uh, you could think of using uh, IATA's emission factors. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, details given by, by the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, now, the, the worry is that we have lack of credibility, uh, and so the, the, the uh, vendors can provide ISO standardized LC reports. Um, and the, the challenge is that we when we ask vendors to provide this information, we don't get this information, right? Uh, because they said that that's way too cumbersome. And so th the solution is to sort of work with uh, the, the vendors. Uh, and, but the eventual reality is that the vendors have the data. And even if you decide to pay for the LCA or you were d deciding to do the modeling, you still would rely on the vendor for the information. And so it's very important to uh, have partnerships with vendors that are willing to make this journey with you and provide you the information for your scope three reporting down the line. I would like to highlight the, the use of EPDs, the environmental product declarations, which are basically a smaller, uh, more useful version of uh, LCA reports that could be used to derive greenhouse gas emission factors for different products. So say a vendor would create uh, these EPDs and provide it to uh, uh, an organization like um, uh, who, who has to report, and, and they would be able to extract the G GHG emission data f directly from the EPDs and use it. So this is a sort of, EPDs are standardized, credible uh, uh, input, you can imagine, that you could use from your vendors, so you could ask your vendors to provide this kind of information. Right? So in a way, it makes your job easier when you do your sports, uh, scope three calculations. And so uh, making scope three simpler for, for, uh, is, is possible. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, there, there needs to be changes in procurement and tendering that, that may be required to make this transition more straight, uh, straightforward. Uh, so in, in the near term, what we need are models. So I give you an example of the studies that we do. We, we quantify the uh, the life cycle carbon emissions associated with water in Hong Kong. So it's a public utility. Everybody has an, uh, uses water. Uh, the WSD actually also goes and has an estimate on their carbon emissions as well. And so these are basically GHG factors. So I, we do LCAs, you, we develop models, and then you can use those GHG factors in your scope three analysis, right? So that's the logic. Uh, in, the, in the long term, um, sorry, this is another example of internet-related emissions. So you, you can also, scope three actually covers uh, for internet companies all of the internet-related emissions. And so that's, that's uh, we need to build out models to quantify them as well. And um, this, in the med medium term outlook, I would say that if you look at the region uh, for the LCI databases that exist, uh, I would say that we need something for Hong Kong as well. Uh, so down the line, uh, as, an, as an early mover advantage in this field, we should be developing LCI data, databases that, are, uh, that are allow for uh, the, the entities within Hong Kong to use these databases to make those uh, 
uh, e scope three disclosures more uh, credible. So right now we have a lot of uh, exposure from uh, Europe and uh, North America, but not as much for, 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 for Asia. And then finally, the long term would be to integrate it with uh, accounting, financial accounting integrated with sustainability, scope three reporting and resilience is what we as researchers are focused on. Uh, and I think that's something that if you are interested in trying to figure out how can you get returns and correlate returns with uh, environmental uh, steps or initiatives, well, some, we need something very complex that is going to be spatial in nature and looks at both the uh, regional scale emissions and the planetary scale uh, thresholds for those emissions. And I, I would also highlight the education part. Uh, so at CityU, we have started a new uh, double degree program on accounting and environmental engineering together. Uh, the, the more uh, such efforts needed because we do not have the, 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 the workforce with the right skill sets to merge sustainability information, which is very data driven, and, uh, and then the finance as aspects are, are basically taught in different programs and we need to put them together so that we get the workforce with the appropriate skill sets. So, so yeah, uh, that's how I would like to end. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chopra. Thank you. It is our collective effort to decarbonize if we wish to contribute to a resilient future. Our next speaker, Ms. Kenneth Lau, Sales and Marketing Communications Manager, Worldwide Vision Center, has rich experience in deploying pro-tech solutions for partners to achieve ESG goals and enhance. Today, she will give us sharing on how to decarbonize workplace and real case sharing. So please welcome Ms. Kenneth Lau. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Yu, and all honorable guests. Yes, I'm Kenneth. On behalf of Worldwide Admission Center, thank you for having us here to share some of our experience in the decarbonization journey in real estate and property management workplace in Hong Kong. Thank you all. And my company, Worldwide Admission Center, we have been working with property investment and management for over 30 years. We are the integrator provide one-stop solutions for cleaning, engineering, the basic stuff, as well as the prop tech in the field. In 2023, we have launched WE Solutions, a comprehensive solution that integrates cutting edge uh, technologies to support real estate sector to achieve ESG goals and enhance work quality and efficiency at the same time. We have deployed technology like IoT solutions and AI to reduce carbon emissions by creating energy efficiency, operating efficiency, improve resources allocation, provide digital communication tools to reduce using pro uh, less paper and minimize travel-related emissions, etc. Our mission and vision is always being the ESG partner for our clients and to the society. In September, we have received Excellent Intelligent Green Building 2023 System Awards presented by Asian Institute of Intelligent Buildings. But in fact, what we have done, what we have done is we have retrofit digital transformation to old buildings. While the transformation involves different phases, we start from collecting data with IoT solutions to minimize potential risk and to enable immediate actions to mitigate hazards. As a result, largely enhanced operation efficiency and resources allocation. We have our own team in Hong Kong Science Park to telemate solutions to solve the pain points for our clients. As it is a local team, we have better understanding the local situation and work practices providing on-site support. Currently, we have provided IoT solutions in over 400 properties, including residential and commercial buildings, as well as shopping malls and car park in Hong Kong. We can share some examples here. 
uh, maybe all of you know, in April, a woman fell unconscious in disabled toilet and eventually found dead after six hours. How to use IoT to avoid similar accident? We have developed a cost-effective disabled toilet sensor. Once the toilet door is shut, the sensor will detect if there's any motion in the toilet. If there's no motion for over 30 minutes, operation staff will receive alert. Immediate action to check on the user's status can avoid serious accident. Another example is lift control solution. We install sensor inside lift shaft. Once water leakage is detected, trigger control sensor in lift machine to raise the lift to top floor to prevent damage to the lift and save up to one million maintenance costs. We have also deployed wireless temperature sensor to cold storage warehouse and cold truck to ensure appropriate temperature in the ambience, which is significantly prevent food spoilage and wastage, optimizing the operation efficiency. As mentioned, a deployed IoT sensor to collect data is just the first step. Afterwards, we can use the IoT platform to control and manage the device remotely by integrating with systems like BMS, uh, enable automation to achieve energy and operation efficiency. Here, I would like to share a real case, how technology integration can create energy efficiency. In Hong Kong, it is very common that building employed multi proprietary systems to manage different facilities in the building. For example, BMS building management system, HVAC system to manage the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. While they operate independently, the proprietary system have their own data format and do not collaborate. But that will soon become history. The latest trend is applying Open Building Information Modeling, BIM, an approach to building design, construction, and operation that emphasizes collaboration, incorporation, and open standards data. We have applied this model in enhancing the energy efficiency in Times Square, a luxury shopping center and office tower complex opened in 1994. In order to enhance the cooling tower performance at Times Square 1, uh, we have integrated various technology and systems, including IPing, AI, BIM, GIS with open standard. We have applied IPing on the cooling tower condensation pipe to reduce the surface temperature. Install IoT sensor at cooling tower to check the surface temperature of the condensed pipe and then supply and install AI control system. By collecting all the data with the OpenBIM platform, optimize the power output of the cooling tower via BMS automatically. We can see there are actually a lot of data uh, need to be exchanged from different systems. With the OpenBIM platform, we can optimize the power output of the cooling tower via BMS automatically. This is the uh, OpenGIS system that we have deployed in these solutions. With the data analysts, show the condensed water pipe surface temperature drop over 12 degrees Celsius, and cooling tower condensed pipe internal water temperature reduced by around 2 degrees Celsius. After the AI optimization, the respective cooling tower has reduced 10% energy saving. The, um, of the cooling tower. There are also other initiatives we have implemented to encourage decarbonization in the workplace. We have implemented QR codes for report and record maintenance digitally. This can help information storage and minimize using paper. Well, we have also using C polar filters in AHU. The filter has achieved global recycle standard. Moreover, this Hong Kong invention can capture and eradicate bacteria and virus in rapid airflow without additional energy consumption. 
in this case in Hong Kong Times Square, we can see uh, and learn two lessons. The importance in system collaboration, open data, stand, open data standards, sharing data is one of the key direction in technology in achieving decarbonization. The second one is reduce carbon footprint via sustainable procurement. Evaluate the environment impact of the supply chain. It's very important to achieve decarbonization. There's one more case I would like to share. In Hong Kong property management field, staff are located in different locations all over Hong Kong. How to keep efficient communications, provide effective training to ensure service quality has become a challenge for lots of property management companies as well as developers. We have developed we have developed a staff app. As all staff do have their own mobile phone, we have used, utilized this as a vehicle for paperless communication with staff. With this app, Staff can complete most of their application, like leave application, petty cash application, etc. Besides, management can use this mobile app to provide training to staff virtually. Like our client, a company with over 5,000 on-site staff, the deployment of these applications has offered great decarbonization result, as it has replaced paper application and minimized staff travel to headquarters to join the training section. With the same consideration, we have also de developed an online procurement system to ensure information transparency, accelerate the procurement pr process, and enable paperless approval process, and, and result in decarbonization in workplace. Apart from the communication tool for staff, we have developed property management applications for communicating with stakeholders like building construction company and occupants. This mobile app has covered different stages, including inspection, unit handover, facility management, and finally, an occupant's application to enhance their lifestyle in the property. We deployed, we deployed this system to around 100 buildings in Hong Kong. The digitalized workflow and procedures has contributed to decarbonization in the property management field at the same time, enhance the property management efficiency. With this app, we have gained a certificate of merit in Asia Smart App Award 2022 and 23. In, co in conclusion, we are now in the critical moment to respond to climate risk. We should rethink all the work practice that we are so used to how technology can help to reduce carbon footprint in our workplace. Technology should be a tool to share knowledge and create a better world, not to creating barrier to our solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Candice Lau. So after hearing about how to decarbonize in workplace, it is also as important to carbonize household. So our next speaker, Ms. Grace Tam, Head of Consumer Finance, CEFC. Ms. Grace Tam is the Head of Consumer Finance at the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, has over 20 years of experience in the banking and finance industry with a focus on sustainable finance and decarbonization efforts. She will join us online today to give us a sharing on how to decarbonize households. So let's welcome Ms. Grace Tam. Hi, Grace. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, are you ready? Yes, let's I'm ready. Let's share your slides. You can see my slides? Uh, not, oh, yes, we oh, do. Yes. OK, Great. the time is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Hello, everyone. Good to see you from Australia. Um, so a bit about uh, my background and my company to start off with. Um, so I work at the Australian government's green bank uh, called Clean Energy Finance Corporation, short, um, shortened to be CEFC. And we've, um, we've been given $30 billion from the Australian government to help Australia transition to a low carbon future. 
Now, for me, I specifically focus on decarbonisation of households. And what I'm really interested in sharing with you is the journey that I've been on since 2018 on trying to unlock decarbonisation um, loans by, by consumer loans, so home loans to households to help them um, live in better energy performing homes. Let's start with um, uh, what people typically think about when we think about energy transition. When we say energy transition, a lot of people think, oh, we just need more renewable energy. Um, it's all about solar farm and wind farm. But in order for us to get there quickly um, to meet the 2050 net zero target, what we really need is also to address demand. With population growing and also with um, a future of electric vehicles adding to the um, to the electricity load, we really need to try and address the demand side to help the supply side come through. So with that in mind, um, I looked at back in 2018 when I started at the CEFC, I looked at how we can support the demand side. Also, under the International Renewable Energy Agency's research, in order to help the world transition, we need energy efficiency, which is 25% of the task here. And also electrification is a further 20% of the task. So with this in mind, back in 2018, my um, executive committee challenged me to look at um, how we can create a green home loan that can incentivize builders and households to build to a more energy efficient uh, standard. And also back Back in 2018, we started to see lenders come to market with green home loans in the capital market side. And when we asked them what the standard was of green was, they said, oh, we, we made it up. There's no standard. So we think that homes that were built 12 years ago would be green because Australia's building code hasn't changed. So the latest building code must be green. And we realised that there's a problem there because there, there would be no actual benefit to from an energy perspective or from the homeowner's perspective. So we wanted to create a legacy and create a demonstration effect for Australia and for Australians to understand that they can actually make a difference to their homes um, and it will be a simple way to do it. So the first thing I did was analyse the, the Australian building sector. And as you can see there, it's quite a fragmented system. So if you look at the grey, um, the area inside the grey circle there, you know, when someone's looking to buy a home, the homeowners involved, they will need to talk to lawyers and then they'll need to talk to the lenders Builders and traders may be involved, the government will be involved, and of course, home valuers will be involved. So it's quite a fragmented market. And in trying to find a particular um, cohort to influence, we decided that if we create a deeply discounted home loan to signal to homeowners that they should ask for um, all these energy improvement to their homes, then that will demonstrate that there is a demand out there for, um, for uh, greener homes. And that will in turn incentivize the rest of the ecosystem to um, upskill themselves in relation to uh, green homes energy performance. So then the next ring of the circle there, you can see what we want to do is, for example, get the, the lenders to start offering green loans, the lenders to understand what green means and create impactful green loans to, that will create uh, lead to greener homes. We need the builders to understand how to improve the building performance and upskill themselves so that they can build and retrofit the stock to the better performing. Also, we need the government to set better um, policy and planning. And then we also want valuers to start taking into account any improvement in the energy performance of homes so that those homes get a higher valuation. And also we want the general public to become more sustainability minded to understand what they can ask for. So to further research on what a green home loan is, I looked to the USA. So in the USA, um, under the Fannie Mae uh, Green Home Loans Program, they have uh, until November 2021 issued and created over $100 billion US dollars worth of green loans. So they are the biggest green loans um, creator globally. 
And I looked, uh, I spoke to them back in 2018 to ask them how they set the green home loan setting. Benny Bay is a government um, supported organisation similar to my organisation. And they said they really wanted to create a green home loan um, with their own settings in mind. And what they did was they worked with banks who would go and originate those homes for them and in turn sell those loans back to them. And what Fannie Mae um, said was that they required homes to be built to a certain um, a performance standard if they're built, new built or if they are for retrofit, they wanted a 30% improvement in both water efficiency and or electricity consumption. And they said to me that, that, was, uh, that they knew that it would be quite hard to get momentum at first because it was something new that they were rolling out to the market. But again, with a deep interest rate discount, they hoped to generate interest. And they told me that after having the program up and running for two to three years, they started to see the ecosystem develop. They started to see more and more home energy assessor um, uh, companies being started. They could then leverage those assessors to help homeowners improve the homes. They could see more and more home energy auditors come up and they could use those auditors to help validate the energy and water performance. And with that, they also started to see more and more banks happy to sign up to their program and refer those loans to households. So they said it's a journey, but then the impact of the journey is to create this ecosystem to help the market become self-sustaining. So I took all of that advice on board, and 2000, in, in 2020, I launched, launched Australia's first green home loans program with a small like-minded bank um, in regional Australia. And our result was that we um, more than doubled the initial expectation in terms of uptake to the extent where they started seeing new clients come to their bank because the clients started to become aware of their green home loans and realised they're a green lender. So they packed up all of the banking and moved to this bank that we worked with. Um, so the way I've set up the green home loans with this bank was that through the bank we created green home loans for two products. One is for constructing brand new homes and the second one is to retrofit existing homes. And what we wanted to do was to demonstrate that there is demand, um, a cohort of demand in Australia. Now, we've, we've, we're now three, close to three years down to track and what we've demonstrated is that um, there is a lot of interest in improving the energy performance of homes. And in Australia, there is a Facebook group called My Efficient Electric Home where 80,000 um, people have signed up and they exchange ideas and information about how to improve the energy performance of their homes. And also with that, um, we've stimulated some government think, uh, policy ideas in relation to um, helping home energy upgrade at scale. So at the bottom left-hand corner there, I've called out CoreLogic and CSRO. CSRO is Australia's um, chief science um, department. And they've realised that if we rely on home energy assessors to go into each individual home to recommend um, steps that the household could take, that takes too long. So what they've designed is an AI algorithm that takes into account existing home attributes that are available in home valuation report, which core logic stores. So they've matched the two set of data and created a, 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 a program called Rapid Rate, which basically using AI, they can generate a 95% accurate home energy rating for all home addresses with that um, home value data stored with CoreLogic. And what they're doing now is washing that data with banks' home loans book to identify which homes are lower performing so that banks can provide um, additional advice and also lower, lower, um, green, lower interest rate on their loans to help household make those home energy improvements. Again, we're riding on this um, uh, ESG wave and sustainability targets that the banks have set from, for themselves to then feed in um, data to help banks identify pathways to transition their mortgage book. The other parts that have sprung out is on the right hand side of this presentation where Green Star has created um, a net zero home plan 
to work with volume builders. So volume builders are builders who build according to standard plans and they build in bulk. Um, and if we can help those volume builders understand what net zero homes look like and create those specific plans, then they can help um, roll out those plans to households so that they can start building net zero um, uh, homes for the future. The other part that's happened um, also is for um, the government's home energy rating certificate. So in Australia, for every single new home, you need to get a home energy rating certificate. And to date, that has only addressed the thermal performance of homes. That has largely ignored the operational aspects of the home. So Australia has world-class solar, and putting on solar can really re reduce the energy demand of the home from the grid. Also adding energy efficient appliances such as hot water and air conditioning system that can further drive down the energy consumption of the home. So through this green home loan, um, we have demonstrated to, uh, to the government that the home energy certificate can really be used to help household understand what um, the, the energy performance of the home is. And so what the government has done is built out these operational aspects to their home energy rating certificate so that, um, so that that can be added in the future to new green home loans product. The Australian government's also working on a disclosure framework. Right now, there's no mandatory disclosure. So when people are buying or renting a home, we don't know the home energy performance of that home. So people would move into a home and realise that it's really hot to live in and it will cost them a lot of money to run the air conditioner. So the Australian government is now looking at a disclosure framework so that in the future, when people are buying or renting a home, they will have access to the home energy rating of their home. So through this Green Home Loans Program, we have um, made way to, to show Australian um, banks as well as government policy um, uh, setters in terms of how we could um, generate and start stimulating the development of, the, of this wider ecosystem. Um, and we have demonstrated that there is um, consumer demand out there for greener homes. Um, to compare and contrast, I looked at uh, Germany's program. So in Germany, they have a long-running home uh, efficiency program, again, run by the German government. They offer both loan and grant, and they work through retail banks to offer discounted loans or grants to, to households. Now, what's different in Germany is that they have a lot of high-rise building, I guess similar to Hong Kong. So they worked with a lot of large building owners to go and either build to higher energy performing new buildings or to retrofit existing buildings. And again, they um, demonstrated the, that through this program, they have been able to stimulate the development of the ecosystem in terms of energy efficiency experts, um, energy efficiency um, skills in the building industry with the building companies and also with building owners. So they have been successful, so successful in that whatever the government set as the um, energy efficiency threshold that they will finance for new construction, that becomes the latest um, building um, threshold without the need to use policy. So I think through demonstrating that um, there is um, interest from homeowners for greener homes, we can drive um, the ecosystem to further upskill themselves and develop the methodology, the processes, the skills, the know-how and the supply chain so that we can start having uh, more higher energy performing homes. And what, what we really need is um, someone to make a start and with the examples that I've given to you, it's been the government that has made a start. And I think um, government can't, can't do everything alone. We need both government and private sector to work um, together. And the reason is because um, with both the Fannie Mae and the German funding program, it has been quite expensive, especially in a German program where it has been a strain on German government budget where they have had to cut the program recently. So I think for a successful program, we need both 
the government, corporate, and also the private sector to work together to um, try and support the, the greening of the household, the, the evolution of this program. So in conclusion, um, I want to start back with where I started my presentation with, um, and that is that in order to support the energy transition that we need, we need to address both energy supply in terms of renewable energy supply, as well as support that with reduced energy demand. And I think with so many homes um, being key to people's well-being and also with homes being uh, energy efficiency and um, electrification being a key um, driver of this energy transition pathway, we we, th we really should think about how we can help households transition and how we can help households decarbonize. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Grace Tan, for sharing her experience to us. Next, we will have our first panel discussion session, and this will also be our last session for our morning conference. The topic is low carbon technology and innovation. I'd like to first welcome our moderator. Please welcome Mr. Sean Sebastian Chakraton, managing partner, Cavendish Investment Corporate to the stage. And as well, our panelists. We have six of them. First, Mr. Dixon Chen, CEO and founder, CS Tech Solution Limited. Ms. Helena Fong, head of sustainable finance and investment. Asia Pacific London Stock Exchange Group. Mr. Jeffrey Kwok, Senior Manager, International Business, Power Assets Holdings Limited. Ms. Kenneth Lau, Sales and Marketing Communications Manager, Worldwide and Vision Center. Mr. Vincent Kwok, the Deputy Managing Director of Hong Kong and Macau, Hilla Packard Enterprise. And as well, Engineer Jasper Chen, Senior ESG Manager, the Hong Kong and China Gas Company Limited, Town Gas. Let's give them a round of applause and welcome our guests today for this panel discussion. And Sean, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is our last panel session, so I know that we're just before lunch. Uh, but I'm pleased to welcome you on our low carbon technology and innovation. So we have some interesting panelists today. Uh, maybe before going into the Q&A, uh, people often ask what are low carbon technology? Well, they are actually mechanics like wind turbines, solar panels, biomass system and carbon capture equipment. And their goal is to actually reduce pollution compared to their natural uh, to the traditional energy uh, counterpart. So today we have, um, we have limited time, but I will try to make sure that everyone actually explains a bit their role. So the first uh, speaker and the first question will be for Elena Fung. Elena is the head of sustainable finance and investment Asia Pacific at the London Stock Exchange. So from your point of view, Elena, how can investors identify opportunities for investing in green technology and innovation? And what additional factors should be taken into consideration? Thank you for the question. And thanks to Dr. Yu and to the World Green Organization for the invitation to participate. Very pleased to be here. So I'll explain maybe briefly the position that we're coming from. We're obviously a stock exchange and have a large data index and analytics business. So, um, so we're really thinking here about how we can give exposure to green technologies to uh, the investment community. And we know there's huge appetite to invest and allocate away from uh, traditional, let's say, uh, energy intensive activities and towards those companies that are uh, addressing and mitigating the risk of, of climate change. So I think from a, from a policy perspective, the way that uh, investors are able to think through uh, how they identify and find those companies that are uh, 
that are in, in, the, in that process of decarbonizing their, their product and service mix. We're doing a lot of work, uh, both in terms of engaging on policy. So we've got taxonomies emerging across the globe now. We're, we're uh, ourselves tracking around about 20 different taxonomies. And we've also got a lot of rich data reserves to be able to analyze uh, the green economy. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, what the numbers around the green economy look like and also some of the opportunities specific to Asian markets um, as well. But I would just say that it's a very, it, it, investors should think of this as a very broad and diverse market. So, I mean, you mentioned some of the opportunities around uh, maybe wind turbines, maybe renewables. It's actually a very, uh, a very sort of, uh, let's say, um, uh, fragmented market in many ways in terms of investors really being able to look at what investors are doing to adopt green technologies and to think about what that means within their own transition plans and in the uh, the products and services that have environmental utility that they're, that they're producing. Key questions for investors thinking about this and if you think about the ways that the way that many of these taxonomy documents uh, and policies are being framed it's about looking at the environmental benefit and how you can decarbonize it's also about thinking about um, some of the risks around some of these emerging technologies and and looking at companies in terms of what they're doing overall so it's not just about the environmental benefits also about thinking about what exposures that might lead to um, and, and also, uh, I guess the other thing is, is looking overall at whether or not we're going to stay the course to 1.5 degree world, because certainly if we are, then there are a lot of emerging technologies uh, within that that are going to help us to decarbonize, whether you think about energy efficiency, you think about green buildings, for example, and of course, uh, renewable energy. If we're not on course for 1.5 degrees, then it's really about thinking what are the climate adaptation technologies that investors uh, are going to need to look at. So it's really about taking a very broad approach to, to the green economy, green technologies overall, um, and to thinking through how that can then be used uh, to build a portfolio um, around some of those opportunities. Very good. Thank you, Elena. The next question will be for Dixon Chan. Dixon is the CEO of CS Tech Solution. So Dixon, perhaps from your point of view, what is the role of carbon capture uh, in utilization achieving net zero emission target? Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, because we have to uh, limit our the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, so we have to achieve uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, achieving net zero, means that we have to uh, remove uh, an equal volume of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere as we release into it, right? So, but um, as, as you know, like uh, there's uh, like continuous growth uh, in the sustainable uh, technology over the past few years. The uh, carbon emission continue to rise. This is because in uh, some of the industry, it is very hard for them to decarbonize, such as the cement, the steel, the uh, aviation, the coal mining industry, these uh, sectors are very difficult to uh, electrify. Therefore, in order to fight the uh, climate change, we have to look for a new technology, climate tech technology that requires such as CCU solutions. Uh, carbon capture utilization solutions prevent uh, CO2 from emitting into the atmosphere by capturing the CO2 as source from the emission point and then subsequently using the CO2 in different uh, downstream applications such as dry ice, agriculture purposes, um, cement-based construction materials, carbonated drains, or even in a sustainable field. Furthermore, like in for the projects in which the CO2 can be uh, permanently stored or converted, carbon credits can be created as well. So in my opinion, like uh, CCU technology uh, plays an important role in the uh, net zero roadmap. Thank you very much, uh, Dixon. And my next question will be for Vincent Kwok. Vincent is the Deputy Managing Director at Hewlett Packard for Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, Vincent, just Dixon mentioned about new technology solution. So in your experience, you know, what are some of the most promising low carbon technologies and innovation? that have the potential to significantly reduce carbon emissions? Hey, um, thank you, Sean, for the question. And also thank you, Dr. Yu, for the invitation. Um, it's actually a very good question because um, running a sustainable IT is crucial. 
And uh, some of the speakers earlier today talked about uh, one of the area that we can control the carbon emission will be from the energy side. And I think a lot of you would not uh, disagree that uh, data center generate a lot of heat. Um, I think a lot of you watch Netflix and may not a lot of you know about watching 30 minutes Netflix already cause 1.6 kilograms of carbon emission. And that's equivalent to driving four miles with your car. So I think that's huge. And secondly, a lot, a lot of people are using generative AI today. And um, when you talk to the generative AI, chat GDPT, whenever you ask them five to 10 questions, they need around 500 millimeter water to cool it down. Like whenever you talk to them, uh, generative chat GPT will use a bottle of water to cool it down. So with all that emission um, heat going on, so what could we do? So being a technology leader in this industry, HPE we actually provide in two areas. First of all, we actually help customers on the component level because uh, as I mentioned, one of the key areas that we need to do for re reduce carbon emission will be the direct cooling. And then the direct cooling meaning that direct cooling down to the component level of the CPU uh, and also the e equipment chips. So what, that's one area that uh, we're helping them. Uh, the second area is that actually we help customers to help lay down their strategy when it comes to a uh, sustainable IT. Because it's very important, as I said, um, running the data center is huge. So you need to have an AI operated environment so that they can efficiently run the data center. One example that other technologies that uh, company use will be uh, IoT and AI device. For example, some of our customers are using IoT device to control the ATM machine. Uh, HSBC actually use one of the solutions that they use the AI operation so that they can provide a just-in-time replenishment of the ATM machine. And that's actually helped to reduce a lot of carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. My next question will be from Jeffrey Quoke, who's a senior manager at Power Asset Holdings Limited. So, Jeffrey, from a government perspective, uh, what should they do to encourage and safeguard investors, you know, in low-carbon innovation before these technologies are actually commercially viable? Okay, thank you, Sean. Before I answer your questions directly, I, let me quote a few figures. The leverage cost of electricity generated from different sources, coal, gas, and technology during the past 10 or 15 years. All along, the coal and gas is quite stable, the cost for generating it, because of the fuel cost. It's a range of about, for coal, it's about 70 something per megawatt hour. And gas is to the range of 80 something. Okay, you remember this all along this past 10 years. And how about solar PV? Back in 2009, it's 300 or 400 US dollar per megawatt hour. What, what is the present value? What is the present time? It's just 40 US dollar per megawatt hours. Compared to gas and oil, you remember, 80, 70. That means today everyone will have incentive to find a place to build solar without any incentive, right? But, but during back in 2009, so how to, the people will invest in the 400 dollar per megawatt hours. So they really need the government subsidies to encourage it. And until the market grow by itself, then they will attract a lot of players to come in. Scholars will have the market to, to do more research, to have more new technology materials, and the manufacturer will have streamlined the process. Now, for the time, Two, uh, 15 years ago, a uh, solar panel of one meter times 1.7 meters generate 200 watts. Now the same size, they have 400, double. And they have, they, instead of just getting light from here, they can also get light from here. So, so the technology or the market will attract a lot of players coming in. But having said that, government needs incentive. But this policy should be long lasting. Remember, those who invest in 2009, 2010, they still survive on the incentives, government's policy. If, if they stop paying it now, they, the, the project cannot survive. 
So this is a, a, a long-lasting uh, uh, policy the government should do. And another one is the government should. Now, everyone you know that electric vehicle is very familiar this day, popular. But a lot of, I think, those who own EV, EV that they know that difficult to find a charging space unless they, they are fortunate that they, they are, their own parking space in their home have. Uh, so the government actually should work together. Even new technology, no new, uh, no carbon intent uh, technology, uh, mature. The other infrastructure should, should be in place. This is my opinion. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. The next question will be for Jasper Chan, who's the senior ESG manager at Town Gas. Uh, Jasper, energy companies they play an important role in low carbon energy transition. Can you give us some example and in innovative energy solutions? Yeah, hello. From Mingnet to Mingnet, China. So just now, Dixon mentioned about watching Netflix will create some carbon emissions and energy companies are obviously the one who can help the customers, if not only asking them to watch Nets. So from Town Gas, we have been using a lot of different and providing a lot of different kind of renewable energies. For example, we started using the landfill gas uh, back from the 1999. So it's about uh, 24 years ago. And at the same time, in, the reason why I'm in the mainland China and cannot attend the conference is that we are having a lot of developments in the renewable energy in the mainland China. For example, currently we have two food waste treatment plants that can turn food waste into biogas and inject directly into the grid that we are operating in different kinds of cities. Uh, second part is that we have now chemical plants that can generate green methanol from waste tires we have uh, chemical plants that can generate uh, HVO, uh, the newest kind of biodiesel, as well as bioaviation fuel from waste of vegetable oils, as well as animal fats. Uh, we are actually having a lot of new investments in the mainland China to develop uh, renewable energy as well. Uh, if we are talking about uh, Hong Kong, we are actually promoting the use of hydrogen in the uh, city gas pipe because uh, for the customers in Hong Kong, uh, some of us already know that uh, in from more than 160 years ago, town gas pipes has been transporting town gas, which is a mixture of different kind of components, but the major part, about 50% of it is hydrogen. So town gas is developing the model. Uh, if there is a customer that needs hydrogen, we can put a setup on site and then extract directly from the pipe network so that you don't need to build your own extraction facilities or general facilities, generation facilities. Uh, and you don't even need to worry about the very high energy intensive uh, process of transporting liquid hydrogen, not to talk about the safety and other hazards that could happen uh, behind the scene. So energy companies have a lot, have a lot of roles to play in energy transition. And uh, my advice to the customers would be uh, choose smartly and look into the carbon emission of the energy you use. There are a lot of new energy uh, which is very innovative, very, which is very environmental friendly and could be affordable as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. The next question will be for Kenneth Lowe, who's the Sales and Marketing Communication Manager at Worldwide Envision. So, uh, Kenneth, what are the most common barriers uh, for promoting decarbonization? solution in the workplace and in your opinion what is the best first step to start decarbonization in the workplace um i think uh with our in our experience the most common barrier is the um, resistance from staff sometimes uh, because especially in the property management field a lot of the staff they are quite uh old-fashioned, they are not very used to new technology. So when we deploy the technology solutions for decarbonization, for them it's something that they're really not used to. To uh, overcome this uh, issue, we have to make sure our system is user-friendly enough. And um, with the local culture, uh, we must have it bilingual. 
uh, with Chinese and English less and must because we we can uh, observe in the uh, property management sector we do have uh, staff from uh, with different cultural background. Um, user friendliness is really important. And then um, what is uh, the, the the next question is uh, how can uh, we deploy. Uh, in a more efficient way, or how, how, how to deploy uh, easier. I think it, we need to communicate with the top management better. We, uh, in fact, a lot of the solutions, um, when we talk about uh, the um, technology investment, uh, we may think of it's an investment. Uh, it is um, big capex, but in fact, uh, especially in our experience is we need to show the top management uh, it's not uh, only an investment, it's, it is an investment with good payback, uh, with good payback period. And they do not need to put in a lot of capex. It actually can operate in an operation expenses. Uh, they can, like, like the solutions that we provide, they can, they can like um, monthly installment uh, payment scheme. Like the Hong Kong people, we are very uh, used to, to, the, to pay our property with monthly installment mortgage, right? We have created this kind of model to lower the entrance barrier, which is the, we believe is the best way for us to put the scheme forward. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Maybe I'll do one or two more uh, intervention and then open it up if there are any questions in the audience. Um, Elena, maybe from a financial perspective, what proportion of market cap is aligned to green technology and what are the opportunities specifically in Asia? Um, okay, thanks for the question. So I mentioned that we are doing a lot of research into uh, green technology opportunities in the global uh, listed or public uh, company space. And I'm going to share some of the some of the outcomes from that from the research that we've done in both a, a forward looking and also a retrospective way. So, um, so if we think at the moment that we're seeing market cap aligned to the provision of green technology coming up to around about 10% of total global uh, market cap. Um, so that's a significant increase on what we've seen since 2015, since the, the Paris Agreement. Um, and when we started measuring this in 2008, it was around about 1% of listed market cap. So we're now looking at significant amount of growth. However, to shift to a 1.5 degree aligned trajectory, we'd need to be looking at around 20% of market mm. cap. Um, from uh, from green technologies uh, and and solutions, and to give you uh, an idea of the extent of that, as it stands at the moment, we're seeing the listed green economy at around about 6.5 percent mm -hmm. of total market cap. So that's around about four trillion dollars uh, worth of market cap. Um, so it's outstripping oil and gas, outstripping the banking sector, for example. So we know it's a really growing opportunity. And as I said before, uh, investors want to have access to this. I think, as Kenneth said, uh, they also want to know they're going to get repaid for it. And when we measure the, uh, the returns to the green economy, we're seeing it significantly outperform uh, traditional market cap um, investment as well, in fact, by around about 76% over that period that we've been measuring it for, so since 2008. So it's outperforming the traditional equity market. Now, in terms of Asia, Asia is the biggest spender on energy transition. It's also the region with the greatest need uh, to transition to low carbon um, as well. It's after the Americas, the second largest uh, space aligned to, to, to green technology from a market cap perspective. But I think we're seeing a lot going into uh, EV. Um, and uh, if you look at China and India together, we can really see that we've got the biggest amount of spending on renewable energy, energy generation uh, in the world. So massive opportunities here um, for investors. We've got China forecast to install uh, almost half of renewable energy globally um, as well between 2022, 2027, so over a five year period. Um, so really seeing a lot of acceleration um, and significant targets in some of the pure play green markets, uh, wind power generation, solar, uh, for example. So lots of opportunity in Asian markets. Thank you, Elena. Maybe our last question would be for Vincent. 
As technology continues to evolve rapidly, how is the latest low carbon technology keeping pace with the changing needs and demands from the society? Hey, thank you, Sean, for the question. Um, it's challenging. And um, as we just mentioned, right, the, um, the business world is actually increasing the demand of the need for the IT technology. And as IDC also forecasted, in the next four years, uh, the requirement of data is actually will be doubling the size. Uh, we are talking about, earlier we talked about AI, right? And a lot of people know about AI, we use a lot of GPU. Uh, to run the GPU that being sold in the world last year, that's actually equivalent to running a nuclear plant. So you can imagine the power required for that is huge. Of course, we can use renewable energy, solar energy, etc. But still, there's still a gap there. Uh, so I think, um, you know, do that, what we need to do, not just purely on technology. As Kenneth also mentioned, people is also important. Process is important. And we need to make sure that um, our corporate, our business corporate also put governance on their company, on their staff to run the data center. And the other thing is um, having an observability is very important. Having a dashboard to show about the, um, the latest uh, carbon emission for the company is also important. So I think all in all, it's kind of like a, um, not purely on technology side. We can, of course, we can continue to invent technology, uh, but that may not be catch up. So I think the source of the uh, challenges that we need to solve is also from on us as well, from people's side, how we run the process and governance, that will be key. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes? Good morning. I'm Peter Yip, President of Greater Bay Area Sustainability Institute. Five years ago, I was in United Nations participating a delegate promoting SME sustainability. And that's why this year, I'm fortunate to establish the Greater Bay Area Sustainability Institute in Hong Kong because I see it's a lot of opportunity having you know, all these seasoned experts in this area and also engaging more and more corporates, SME, to go through this sustainability journey. So that's why my question is to ask some you know, insight. How, you know, how this institute can engage in you know, different support uh, to firstly develop you know, more SME owners. Thank you. Perhaps talk about the SME perspective. Elena? Um, I can maybe say something about financing and, yeah. and, and bank lending. So ensuring that there are financial flows that can uh, help to um, uh, support the development of solutions, particularly for SMEs. And I think certainly here in Hong Kong, also I think into the GBA, we see uh, some efforts by policymakers to uh, to help to support that. For example, um, supporting green loans um, from the HKMA. So there, there are some initiatives that I think SMEs can leverage, but also it's the dialogue uh, with their, their banks and with the providers of capital uh, that will be helpful, I think, in that process as well. I think the other thing that we're seeing um, is a greater focus on green trade between different economies. And I think here's where engaging SMEs through both banks, but also through the policy makers and the regulators, stock exchanges, uh, and so on, um, will be helpful. But I talked about taxonomies earlier. Uh, typically, they're focused at the larger companies, actually allowing and enabling uh, the smaller companies to be able to report against those and to measure and monitor what they're doing uh, will be very helpful. I think we're seeing a, a much greater focus on educating and engaging the SME community overall, not just on green technology, but also about thinking through how they do things like measure their impact, their, their carbon emissions, uh, report on that, and then also incentivize that through differentiated financing programs um, as well and therefore enabling them to, to you know, want to and to have a better cost of capital for producing some of these solutions. Thank you. Maybe perhaps one um, last I think, question. If I think from the uh, large corporations, uh, 
maybe your society can help us link up with SMEs because we have been through a lot of uh, difficult steps alongside the journey of ESG development, and we are very keen and open to share our experience. So maybe your society can help us link up uh, to foster some more discussions and uh, experience sharing. Uh, together, I think we can go even faster. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, perhaps? If not, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank you for attending this panel session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Helena, Jeffrey, Kenneth. Vincent and online with us, Jasper, and also Dixon. Thank you very much. So this concludes our morning session and will be our lunch break. Our afternoon session will begin at 2.30 sharp and the registration table will be ready at 2 p.m. So we'll see you again at 2 p.m. after lunch. Thank you.